Good afternoon. The next item of business is a debate on motion 15426 in the name of Aileen Campbell on celebrating the role of credit unions in Scotland's communities. Can I ask those members who wish to take part in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now? And I call Aileen Campbell to speak to and move the motion. Cabinet Secretary, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. January is traditionally the time for resolutions. And for many of us, taking control of our personal finances is at the top of that list. Whether it's paying off debt, saving for the future, or a specific item or event, many people will be thinking about how they can manage their finances better. And, presiding officer, I hope people will look to their local credit union to support their aims. Credit unions are communities of people who unite and pool their money to provide each other with ready access to credit. This philosophy of people helping people is at the core of the credit union movement. As member-owned financial cooperatives, credit unions exist for the benefit of the people that use their services. They are not for profit and as such, any funds they make goes right back into providing competitive rates on savings and loans, which is why they can use the line people not profit with pride. Credit unions have at their heart the principles of individual responsibility and mutual assistance and are driven by a singular purpose, to serve their members. They improve the lives of people through encouraging the wise use of credit and teaching the importance of budgeting. Some credit unions also provide complementary services in addition to savings and lending, such as current accounts and mortgages. And credit unions themselves are diverse, ranging from small community models to large organisations handling millions of pounds. Many people, though, are surprised to learn that over 420,000 people in Scotland are already members of the 90 credit unions in Scotland. That means approximately 7.7% of the population, and that's compared with around the 1.4% in England and the 2.7% in Wales. And that's why it's so important that this Parliament and its members continue to celebrate and support the important role credit unions play in our communities as providers of ethical financial services and look to what else we can do to promote credit unions to the people of Scotland. In November at Capital Credit Union in Edinburgh, I launched a new campaign, a new national campaign funded by uh, the Scottish Government to make more people aware of credit unions and the ethical and affordable services that they provide. And I hope members in the Chamber saw the campaign's key message of people not profit on the posters, buses online and in newspapers across Scotland or heard the adverts on the radio. And that campaign sought to do two things. First, to challenge some of the prevailing myths that surround credit unions, for example, that they are only for the financially excluded or that they are less secure than banks. And second, to promote the unique strengths of the sector in easy to understand messages. And these included that credit unions are owned and controlled by the people that use their services, that credit unions know that you are more than your credit score, that all customers will receive a friendly and professional service, and that credit unions are for people from all walks of life, and that folks should actively consider joining the 400,000 plus people already benefiting from being a credit union member. Yeah, absolutely. Neil Finlay. And thanks, and I think it's a very good campaign. Um, I've been trying this week to find out what the Scottish Government's total investment in credit unions are. I wonder if the uh, Minister could confirm that figure in, the, um, throughout her, in part of her speech for me. Yeah. Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, I, I, I will uh, confirm, because there is a number of areas in which we are investing to support credit unions, not least through the junior savings uh, work, and uh, I want to say a bit more about that uh, shortly. I do have the figure, I just can't locate it, but I do have the figure, and also the, the funding that we're putting into the, the advertising campaign to support uh, credit unions. And that's in addition to some of the other softer support that we're providing around uh, payroll deductions uh, as well, to try and promote to others the benefits of credit unions. So uh, absolutely, I'll come back with the, with the figure, but certainly uh, I want to point, uh, come to junior savings a, a bit later on in my opening remarks. And while launching the campaign at Capital Credit Union, I had the chance to meet uh, wonderful people who work and volunteer there. I met Jessica, a young volunteer, and I think her words helped illustrate the unique qualities that set credit unions apart from other lenders, also known as the credit union difference. And she said, you feel like they genuinely have your best interests at heart and staff are keen to teach you how to manage your savings. 
What I particularly like is the fact that you must save alongside paying any loan repayments, and it's very ethical. I also like the way they promote their products, but don't encourage people to go over their financial limit. Strong words there from Jessica. And I understand that Capital Credit Union is now entering its 30th anniversary. I want to congratulate the staff and volunteers on their continued success and growth. Presiding officer, I also visited NHS Credit Union last month for their 20th anniversary, and I understand the NHS Credit Union began around a kitchen table 20 years ago, founded though by a passionate pro problem solvers who were determined to build a culture of financial resilience amongst NHS staff, offering a safe and convenient place to save and to borrow. But since then, over those 20 years, it's now grown to over 17,000 members living not just in Scotland, but across uh, other parts of the UK and, and north of England uh, as well. And yet another example of a credit... So, yeah, yeah, I just want to point out that that is another example of a credit union carrying out the business for the common good, but also uh, alongside that work, doing it with a real success. I, I Claudia, you Sorry, uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary. And um, having been to the 25th um, birthday party of the South Lanarkshire Credit Union, which um, the, the member will know, know of from her own constituency, um, that's been highlighted to me a lot uh, that the geographical spread and the rural reach of credit unions is a real challenge. And that's partly because of the difficulties of going online. And uh, I wonder if that's being addressed either through um, the Scottish Government campaign or, or in any other way. Before you respond, Cabinet Secretary, not to worry about longer interventions, because I have time in, I have time in hand. If you let me get there, Ms Beamish, it's on your behalf. Cabinet Secretary. You normally have us so regimented that we're quite determined to make sure that things are quick. So thank you for that comfort. I, understand. I give you guidance as always. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you, President Officer. Um, and yeah, I'm really pleased that Claudia Beamish raised that point because I was just about to talk about her and uh, Ruth Maguire actually for their role that they play here in this parliament, but certainly in terms of the point, the more substantive point that Claudia Beamish raises around that geographical um, challenge that presents itself for people in rural areas about accessing it and about that support for online accessibility and about that competitive thing that they might have credit unions with banks as well i think it's absolutely something that we need to look at uh, and support credit unions and to work collaboratively about where there may be solution to those uh, challenges but certainly something that i'm acutely aware of and i thank claudia beamish for raising it uh, and i do want to though lead on from claudia beamish, beamish's uh, intervention to recognise the work that she and Ruth Maguire, who are, respect, who are uh, the, I think Claudia Beamish is the vice convener, Ruth Maguire is the convener of the Parliament's cross-party group on credit unions, which has worked hard to provide use, a useful platform to discuss issues which affect credit unions in Scotland and offers a place to showcase good practice, but also possibly as well to influence future policy decision. And at the most recent meeting of the CPG, I understand delegates heard from the First Alliance Ayrshire Credit Union speaking about their work with the local council and other partners to collectively improve money management by offering a holistic advice service, for example, energy advice, housing uh, ad advocacy, white good provision, a service that has helped hundreds of people to get the advice and support that they need. And similarly, at the, also at the cross-party group, a representative from East Kilbride Credit Union spoke about a scheme that they launched earlier last year, which aims to assist first-time buyers onto the property ladder by working in partnership with an independent financial advisor and encouraging all participants to save for a set period of time before them, uh, providing them with a loan for a deposit. So these are examples of the extension of the people helping people philosophy that underpins the credit union movement and again just shows the breadth of work and scope that credit unions have and their imagination and innovation that they employ. And there are credit unions across Scotland using their services in those creative ways to address a raft of social problems from loans to alleviate funeral poverty to savings accounts to help people stop smoking. Credit unions frequently adapt their services to address specific problems facing the communities they serve, and I'd like to discuss some of those now. As well as developing financial capability in the heart of our communities and workplaces, credit unions are also important providers of financial education, running programmes in local schools to improve financial literacy and encouraging our young people to start good habits of saving. Since 2016, we've invested 274,000 in credit unions to develop new junior saving, saver schemes in schools across Scotland, from Dumfries and Galloway to Murrayshire. So I'm pleased, presiding officer, that there are now over 58,000 junior savers in our credit unions. So we want to build on that good work. So I'm delighted to announce a further 85,000 pounds will be provided to extend the junior savers programme until the end of September 2019. 
and that will enable even more children to engage with their credit union and learn of the importance of saving and managing uh, money. And we're currently evaluating the programme and drawing out some of the key learning as we identify longer term steps for this important piece of work. And I think that goes some way to address some of the issues that Alec Rowley uh, uh, set out in his amendment, which we are delighted uh, to support in the debate today. The Scottish Government also seeks to support the sector in other ways, notably in supporting credit unions to partner with, partner with employers to offer payroll deduction schemes to encourage savings and having access to funds at a time when credit is needed. I believe every workforce should have access to safe, ethical and affordable finance. There are clear links between financial health and levels of well-being and productivity. because Research has shown that one in four workers report lost sleep over money worries and almost 60% of workers and financial worries say it negatively impacts on their performance at work. And there is wider cost to society as it is estimated that this financial stress costs the UK economy £121 billion each year. And that is why we encourage employers from both the private and public sectors to ensure staff have access to regular savings and ethical loans by partnering with a credit union. Unlike financial institutions driven by a profit motive, credit unions are keen to help members understand what they can afford to save and encourage their members to save regularly. For an example of this uh, that many credit unions practice is a save as you borrow model, encouraging members to put an amount into a savings account as part of making a loan repayment. And research by the Fair Banking Foundation found that this approach converted 71% of credit union borrowers surveyed into regular savers, with almost three quarters having never or only occasionally saved before. So this emphasis on encouraging a savings ethos purely for the financial well-being of their members is typical of this unique sector. And in the Scottish Government, we're trying to lead by example with staff encouraged to take up credit union membership. And, presiding officer, I know that the Parliament also encourages staff members here to join in as well. By making it easier for people to build up a savings buffer, we can help keep more people out of the hands of high interest predatory lenders. Being in poverty or on low or insecure income is, of course, a particular barrier for those seeking to access credit. And there are many people for whom accessing mainstream or high street lending is not an option due to issues with credit rating or not having a bank account. And we know that people in these situations can be vulnerable to exploitative lenders who prey on those communities where poverty reduces choice for many. And that is why there is a need for a more developed and sustainable affordable credit market to ensure people have choice over how and when to access the credit that they may need and better access to financial services, including basic bank accounts. And this is why it's also important to support our credit unions and to encourage people to both save and borrow with their local credit union. This support dovetails with our wider work to increase the availability of affordable credit. Last year, we invested £1 million in Carnegie's Affordable Credit Fund, which will help grow the community lending sector and support not-for-profit organisations such as credit unions and community development finance institutions, which are vital to ensuring fair, dignified and affordable lending is available to all. This resource will be used by the sector to provide genuine alternatives to high-cost credit lenders for people on low incomes. And this will be achieved in a variety of different ways, including access to financial capability support, debt advice, savings opportunities, and banking products and services. And I'm also delighted that last October, Fair For You became the first lender to draw down a loan from the Affordable Credit Fund, and that our support for this sector over the next decade will help social lenders work with people on low incomes to increase their financial inclusion. This government also understands the important role that good financial advice plays in helping to lift people out of poverty. And that is why in November, I launched our financial health check. This new service will be delivered by Citizens Advice Scotland and the network and national, nationwide network of Citizens Advice Bureau, backed by over £3.3 million of government funding over the next two years. Those who contact the service will have the option of receiving tailored advice either via the free phone number or face-to-face -face advice in a local citizen advice bureau. The financial health check aims to ensure that low-income families with children and older people can maximise their incomes and reducing the poverty premium which sees the poorest pay more for basic services because they have that limited choice. By accessing good quality financial advice, including benefit uptake and switching to lower cost utilities, we want people to make the most of their money. The financial health check is made up of a number of elements, including access to free school meals, school clothing grants, council tax reduction uptake, and cheaper deals on energy and other utilities to reduce household costs. 
This new service will benefit at least 15,000 households a year and is yet another example of this action this government is taking to increase the financial wellbeing of people across the country. So to conclude, Presiding Officer, I want to reaffirm the Scottish Government's commitment to continue to work collaboratively with the credit union movement to ensure it continues to thrive and develop and be as innovative as it can be. And I certainly look forward to working with members across the Chamber on that shared ambition and no doubt hearing their views and opinions about what more can be done to support this movement. And again, I'm sure that many members will want to highlight the excellent work of credit unions in their own constituencies. And I look forward to hearing those examples during the course of this afternoon's debate, of course, which the motion I move in my name. So thank you. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. I now call on Alec Rowley to speak to and move Amendment 15426.1. Mr Rowley, please. Presiding officer, I move the amendment in my name and in doing so, I'm pleased to open this debate for Labour. I welcome the debate on celebrating the role of credit unions in Scotland's local communities. I know the benefits of credit unions and their impact on communities firsthand. I am a long-term member of a credit union in Fife, the Kingdom Community Bank. Earlier this week, I met members of staff, directors and volunteers of the Kingdom Community Bank, and they asked me to pass on to the Cabinet Secretary their appreciation and support for the recent campaign, promotion campaign, People Not Profit, which they said had resulted in an increase in people joining their credit union. I would pay tribute to Kingdom and to all credit unions here in Scotland. I would want to recognise the role of staff and the hundreds of volunteers, and I hope this debate today will help spread the positive message of the benefits of joining a credit union. Following the financial crash in 20. 808, it was evident that there was a breakdown in trust between people and the banking sector. I have to say, with bank closures and the unwillingness of executives to listen to the needs of local communities, that mistrust remains today. And whilst credit unions are not a new concept, they are more relevant now than ever if we are to foster a culture of saving and sustainable credit. Credit unions have a huge role to play in the development of more ethical and alternative banking services, where the drive to satisfy the need for profit is not the priority of the business model. As the Cabinet Secretary has said, here in Scotland we currently have over 90 credit unions in operation, with a combined membership of over 420,000, including over 50,000 junior savers, holding over £624 million in assets, £350 million out on loans to members, and £537 million in member savings. It is clear, therefore, that credit unions are a major source of economic importance in Scotland. However, there is still a long way to go in growing the membership figures. As the Association of British Credit Unions points out, in the United States, there are over 100 million credit union members, serving around 44% of the economically active population. So one of the key asks here today is how do we manage to grow the credit union sector? A number of reports and indeed the credit union working group from this parliament, which published the report in 2016, have argued that one of the most effective ways of doing this is through supporting partnerships between local employers and credit unions. The Association of British Credit Unions Work Not Worry campaign states that worrying about money affects the health and performance of millions of workers. Employers can help by working in partnership with credit unions. This reduces stress, increases productivity and costs very little. Everyone is better off. The statistics speak for themselves as to why we need to do something about this. One in four employees lose sleep over money worries. 59% of employees with money worries say they are not working at their best. 26% of working age adults in the UK have no savings at all. And a further 29% have less than £1,000 in savings. 
The process of offering a payroll deduction facility would encourage more employees to save and borrow with a credit union, something that would benefit the employer, the employee and the wider community. There are already a number of companies and organisations doing this at present, such as the NHS, local authorities, John Lewis, Royal Mail and British Airways. I hope the Scottish Government will recognise this. I am pleased that they have said today that they will accept our amendment and now it is for this Parliament to come together, work together to encourage more companies and organisations to follow this approach. Credit unions are a way of bringing wider benefits to individuals, families, communities and employers. And they can be the way to tackle one of the biggest challenges in our society, the unacceptable levels of poverty. The Joseph Rowntree Foundation have recognised the role that credit unions can play in reducing poverty. In their report, We Can Solve Poverty in the UK. And further to helping people out of poverty, credit unions can offer a viable alternative to payday lenders that many in our communities sadly have to rely on. With over a quarter of people in the UK having no savings in the bank and even more having less than £1,000 in savings, it is not just the poorest that can benefit from credit unions, but the majority of the population in Scotland can benefit from being part of a credit union. And credit unions want to stress the point that they are not just services for poorer people. They are community services for all people. Credit unions can provide access to loans at a much better rate than offered by many large, well-advertised and highly visible payday loan sharks. Many of us in this chamber will have seen the adverts online and on television which sing the praises of quick, easy access to loans with outrageous levels of interest being charged. But credit unions are less visible, perhaps not so convenient to access, and sometimes people don't really understand what they are. And so it is vital that we start sharing the benefits of credit unions as widely as possible. Partnership working at local level, again, could play a big part in raising awareness. By educating children and the benefits of credit union, which I'm glad the government has accepted in our amendment, we can start to set out a future where poverty is reduced, children have a better understanding of money and budgeting. To highlight a great example of this, I would like to speak about the work being done by the Benarte and Lochgele Credit Union, which is Fife's oldest credit union, where strong links have been developed with the local primary and secondary schools, and indeed the pupils themselves take responsibility for organising credit union savings within the schools. Thus embedding the savings habit at an early age, which hopefully will stay with the children for a lifetime. And this is a model which could be extended across all schools in Fife and Scotland and indeed is contained within the Association of British Credit Unions Credit Union Charter, which states to establish a credit champion in every primary and secondary school across Scotland who will lead that school's partnership with a local credit union and facilitate pupils' involvement. I'm glad to see that Benarte and Lochelle are one of the credit unions leading the way in delivering these kinds of services. In conclusion, presiding officer, put simply, credit unions are community banks. They exist to support and assist the community in saving and lending. They put money directly into local communities and the members share in the profits. This Parliament has much to gain from ensuring that credit unions flourish in the future. I move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much, Mr Rowley. Now call Michelle Ballantyne. Ms Ballantyne, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to open for my party on this debate, highlighting the important role of credit unions in Scotland. Um, and I think it will be a very consensual debate because credit unions have attracted strong cross-party support. There is a well-attended CPG and members of all parties have spoken strongly in favour of credit unions, both in this chamber and at Westminster. 
In the spirit of this approach, I want to start by putting on record that the Scottish Government have done some really good work in this field through their People Not Profit campaign. And I'd also like to recognise that the UK Government have done so also through their various initiatives. Deputy Presiding Officer, I believe we are united in our desire to see the uptake of credit unions promoted and to ensure that all Scots have access to finance and independent banking alongside the regular high street banks who have their own role to play in the market. Credit unions bring a variety of benefits to our economy and can encourage an uplift to productivity, productivity which none of us, I'm sure, would actually not want to see. An American credit union, the Fillane Institute, found that a financially capable workforce not only improves productivity and employer profitability, it also results in less absenteeism, fewer accidents and less job turnover and lower benefit costs. And I think um, Alex was making that very good point when he was talking about how, how much a role credit unions have to play, not only in that day-to-day -day banking, but in that wider societal place. Um, and the Cabinet Minister also touched on that. It is, their, their research revealed that ultimately, employees who are financially secure are better able to learn, change, and grow with the company. So they have a real right place in, in our whole economy. There is a place for also for credit unions in financial education as well, particularly through the junior saver schemes that we've heard talk about. These seek to instill the principle of saving am among pupils at a young age. And I think that we have all so far agreed that that is a commendable aim and one that we should all promote in our own constituencies. Often these schemes are geared towards a specific purpose or incentive, such as saving for a trip, and they can demonstrate the value of saving for greater gain in the long term. Unfortunately, Deputy Presiding Officer, the most recent figures I have available show that a majority of credit unions in Scotland don't operate a primary school junior saver scheme, with even a larger percentage issuing a secondary school project. So I would ur urge members to investigate the credit unions in their constituencies over the weekend and find out if they operate such a scheme and if not, perhaps engage in a conversation to see how we can encourage this good practice to grow. Another area which I'd like to touch upon is that of the payroll deduction schemes that's already been mentioned. This is an idea which enjoys the support of ABCOL, the Association of British Credit Unions Limited, the Char Chartered Institute of Payroll Professionals, the Scottish Government and the UK Government, and the benefits are clear. Payroll deduction is a very simple process with administration largely handled by the credit union. Savings are covered up to £75,000 per person. I wish I could get to that sum, believe me. But it, it is protected, so you're at no risk of losing that money. And it provides an added financial cushion to protect members. I support the SIP's efforts to encourage uptake amongst employers, as I would encourage employers to open themselves up to this idea. SIP have created a payroll data transfer standard that allows a smooth transfer of data of any credit union. So the tools are there, and all we need to do now is promote it. There are positive steps that have been taken to encourage the growth of credit unions. And as the Scottish Government have already pointed out through the Cabinet Secretary today, um, the, the recent campaign that we've seen everywhere, and I hope we will see more of, um, hope will contribute to that. But an example I read of recently was a project involving the Carnegie UK Trust and five Scottish credit unions to help workers in Scotland benefit from credit union membership through their employer by creating a new post, an employer engagement officer. And given that building partnerships with employers is a major issue for credit unions, this step is most welcome. The UK government has also been working to encourage credit union growth. And the Chancellor announced a major package of measures in the autumn 2018 budget, which I hope this chamber welcomes. Boosts for credit unions included the announcement of a pilot prize linked saving schemes for credit unions based on the US model Save to Win, operating in a similar fashion to a premium bond. The Department of Digital, Cultural, Media and Sports Affordable Credit Fund has also helped 66 credit unions lend over 20 million to their members with £5 million of direct investment so far, the positive impact of which has been welcomed by both ABCOL and the Lloyds Banking, credit, Banking, credit, <laughs> Banking Group Credit Union Development Fund. I've got long titles. However, Deputy Presiding Officer, 
One of the, the most significant measures adopted by the UK government, UK government has been expanding the common bond from 2 million to 3 million. This opens up the world of credit unions to a plethora of new potential members and gives them the scope to be ambitious with expansion plans, as well as adapting credit unions to the modern world where people are perhaps not as so closely tied together around a single business or an area as, as they once were. This has refreshed the credit union landscape and I hope we can work together to support this policy. For me, however, one of the recent things I came across is, is around how credit, credit unions interact with welfare payments and budgeting. I was at a recent welfare surgery in East Renfrewshire and I spoke to the staff of the Pioneer Mutual Credit Union and they told me in detail about the partnership working they're doing with East Renfrewshire Council and Barhead Housing Association to, pri to provide a free money management account for universal credit payments. This means that once a universal credit payment is made, the individual's rent is deducted and protected within their account and then transferred directly to their landlord or council, ensuring that their rent is paid, therefore removing the threat of arrears. For those experiencing difficulty with housing costs, this could prove to be a very valuable tool and is a really good example of how credit mutuals work very closely with other partners. In conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, credit unions are a vital source of microfinance in today's complex financial world. The variety, autonomy and specialisation on offer from the sector gives it a depth that traditional banks lack. And it gives a personal touch that cannot be replicated elsewhere. In support of these qualities, I would suggest that we each become a champion for the credit union cause in our own constituencies. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Andy Whiteman. Mr Whiteman, please. Uh, presiding officer, and thank you to the Cabinet Secretary for bringing this debate this afternoon. Scottish Greens were elected on a manifesto to champion credit unions and realistic alternatives to the traditional banking sector, and we're proud to support organisations that promote social responsible uh, lending. We're a party that has an ethical banking policy that encourages cooperation, inclusivity, responsibility, and the, favor of invest in, in, in the favouring of investing over uh, speculating. Uh, the defined purpose of credit unions, as asserted in the Credit Union Act of 1979, very much reflects this vision. According to the Act, credit unions have a statutory uh, basis to promote thrift among members through the accumulation of savings, create sources of credit for the benefit of members at a fair and reasonable rate of interest, use and control members' savings for their mutual benefit, and train and educate members to prudently manage their own financial affairs. I just would like to mention other welcome uh, initiatives. In, in December, I was very pleased to speak at a, a roundtable in Parliament chaired by Richard Leonard, at which the Cabinet Secretary uh, also spoke. This was a roundtable on responsible finance organised by Responsible Finance um, Scott Cash, which is a community interest company that is now working closely with credit unions in, in Glasgow uh, and the Carnegie uh, UK uh, Trust. At times, of course, as everyone knows, until recently, uh, the banking sector has principally uh, been the antithesis of everything that the credit union movement represents, with the dominance of large multinational financial institutions, as witnessed with their downfall over a decade ago, these banks such as RBS, HBOS and Lloyd's TSB operated too often not in the interests of their customers or wider society, but for the perceived short-term benefit of their shareholders and policymakers and key uh, politicians and policymakers were all in favour of the light touch regulation, along with myopic industry leaders who took the view that these organisations were too big uh, to fail. And as everyone knows, our global economy was derailed because of a casino style banking system that offered outrageous rewards to well-remunerated executives operating at the limits of legality. And individuals and families and communities who contributed to the public finances and to public institutions, balance sheets uh, were put at risk uh, as a consequence. And the financial crash should have been a wake-up call to begin the process of restructuring the way we do banking and lending in the UK, but apart from some modest tweaks to the system, no fundamental reform uh, has followed. And it's abundantly clear that we do need a new financial services model that's more mutual, more cooperative uh, and more local. And that's where credit unions uh, play a significant uh, role. Alex Rowley cited um, statistics, uh, UK statistics, um, I think, uh, about where families are uh, with finance at the moment. But the latest Scottish household survey shows that 22% of households had no savings at all. 
14% had less than £1,000. Uh, breaking this down by housing tenure, for example, there are obvious inequalities. Uh, the study found, for example, 49% of people in socially rented accommodation had no savings and 18% had less than £1,000 compared to the owner-occupied sector where only 9% had no savings and 11% had less than 1000 There's also a significant gender gap in household finances too as it was found that households where the highest income earner is female were more likely to report not having any savings at 26% compared to 19% for male householders. So the work of credit unions, as the Minister has made clear, in delivering affordable loans and saving options should be encouraged, and we too welcome the government's uh, campaign uh, on, yet, on this. Yet, despite having the obvious demand for such services in communities, we're a long way off, I think, from harnessing their full uh, potential. And to proceed, I think we need to learn from best practice uh, elsewhere. In 2016, in a report called Banking for the Common Good from Friends of the Earth Scotland, the Commonweal, the New Economics Foundation and Move Your Money, the authors set out a plan which would turn away from the highly concentrated profit-driven banking to an ecosystem of institutions such as people's banks, which could be structurally designed to work for the common good. And one of the issues when one looks at this issue, uh, uh, topic is, of course, that much of this is already in place in other European countries. In Switzerland, for example, 45% of people are customers at one of the local banks that incorporate the cantonal network. These branches hold over 256 billion of domestic money and one third of small and medium sized firms conduct their business. In Germany, of course, as well, this successful Sparkassen banking model uh, exists. These are local banks publicly owned with a public interest mandate, restricting them to lending within their geographic uh, area. Sparkassen provide financial services to 43% of all German businesses and account for 70% of SME lending. And it's estimated that 60% of German citizens have a relation with their local branch and no Sparkassen bank has defaulted since the 1970s when a shared safety net uh, was set up. And in principle, this shows, like credit unions, that a prudence over profit model can be a successful business. I welcome Alec Rowley's uh, amendment and in particular its focus on education and welcome the Cabinet Secretary's commitment to expand uh, the funding uh, for that. Too much of the um, support and education around finance that I've seen uh, in schools appears to be sponsored by large financial uh, corporations, which I think is sending a rather confused message uh, to many young people. Uh, in conclusion, presiding officer, Scotland's credit unions uh, can be uh, progressive and bold, but only with political will, sufficient funding and support in place. And I hope that we can be uh, more uh, ambitious than we have been in the past. I support the Cabinet Secretary to build on what's been discussed today to ensure that we actively back the development of this sector to be a strong and stable constituent of Scotland's banking sector and economy. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'll call Liam MacArthur. Mr MacArthur, please. Thank you, Deputy President. Officer. I'm delighted to be taking part in this debate on behalf of the Scottish Liberal Democrats. And like uh, Alex Rowley, uh, I start by declaring an interest. I'm a member of the High Scott uh, Credit Union, uh, which uh, operates across the Highlands and Islands. I can't claim that uh, my savings are a major contributor uh, to helping keep High, High Scott in rude financial health, but it's encouraging to see the credit union making a real positive contribution to communities across the region 12 years after starting from its base in the Western Isles. In the islands I re represent, the credit union works in close collaboration with Orkney Housing Association and with Voluntary Action uh, Orkney, I think demonstrating the sort of uh, partnership approach that's the hallmark of the movement as a whole uh, and which is absolutely critical to sustainability in more uh, remote rural and island areas. With around 3,200 members across the Highlands and Islands, however, it's fair to say that the potential for High Scott to grow is there to deliver the benefits that credit unions bring to more individuals, more households and more communities uh, across the region, particularly in Orkney, and I hope uh, to see this happen. And there is no question, as others have pointed out, that credit unions deliver real tangible uh, benefits, notably in Scotland where they're used uh, more than anywhere else in Europe, I understand, with the exception of Northern Ireland, the Republic of Ireland and uh, Poland. Based on the principle of the common bond, that shared connection within a community, this is a movement that, as the Cabinet Secretary reminded us, is all about people helping people. Whether we're talking about the smaller volunteer-run unions with hundreds of members or the larger unions with paid staff and premises, the principle, the ethos, 
and the objectives remain the same. Essentially, credit unions provide services that are critical in helping combat financial exclusion, especially, uh, but not exclusively, unless we're thought well off communities. Alex Rowley was absolutely right to remind us that um, the credit unions are not just for people in poverty, they are for all uh, people in all communities. But I think there's no avoiding the fact that by reducing the risk of people paying beyond their means for the financial services that we all need, uh, while also encouraging a savings culture, credit unions help build resilience, improve financial capability and nurture cohesion within communities. These are all desirable at the best of times. During a period of economic turmoil such as we've seen over the last decade, the role played by credit unions could hardly uh, have been more important. Since the Lib Labour Lib Dem uh, coalition government produced the first credit union action plan back in 2001, followed by uh, a series of financial investments and support, uh, for their development, we've seen consistent and strong support uh, and progress made. Uh, this is illustrated, I think, by the report produced by the Working Group in Scottish Government in 2016. It underscores, I think, the contribution made by 100 or so credit unions across the country, around 375,000 members, over half a billion uh, pounds in assets, loans approaching 300 million pounds, all big, impressive um, numbers. But critically, the government's 2016 report also identified ways to facilitate the further development uh, of credit unions. And again, this was touched on by the Cabinet Secretary, principally though in the areas of payroll uh, deduction and financial education. In terms of payroll reduction, this is widely recognised uh, as uh, an, idea, uh, an ideal way of enabling people to save regularly and also, where necessary, manage loan repayments effectively. I know the Scottish Government is keen to encourage more employers to offer this as a standard workplace benefit and there is certainly a real appetite amongst credit unions who don't already run uh, such schemes and most in fact do to get involved. Yet all too often credit unions report significant challenges in persuading employers to sign up or where they have done so to promote take up among staff. I appreciate there are no easy answers for addressing this, but I think Alex Rowley is right to argue in his amendment that there is more that the Scottish Government can be doing to encourage employers to offer payroll reduction to credit unions by emphasising the fact that this is a simple process and the administration is largely taken on by the credit unions. Uh, by assuring employers there's no risk to them regarding loan repayments and security around savings, by highlighting the benefits to employees who can access credit and repay loans in affordable instalments, making it easier to steer clear of high cost lending. The government has done, I think, commendable work promoting the living wage, incentivising business to sign up as living wage employers. Uh, but clearly, even those on the living wage can be at risk of financial difficulty and exclusion. And I would suggest there's perhaps an opportunity to more closely link up the work around promoting the living wage to efforts to encourage employers to sign up to payroll deduction arrangements with credit unions. There is then still the question of take up by staff and in this respect I think all the evidence shows that having a workplace champion can be pivotal. Again I would argue that the government can play a key role here too in not just getting employers to sign up to payroll deduction schemes but also to look at ways of promoting this within their organisations including identifying individuals who can act in that champion role. In many respects these same principles could and should be applied to the development of junior saver schemes too. Self-evidently, it makes sense to nurture at the earliest possible age a savings uh, culture. Financial education, after all, is a perfect fit with what Curriculum for Excellence uh, is supposed to be about. Too often, however, schemes that are set up struggle to survive as individual members of staff or pupil groups move on. Good work is being done, and I think I would commend the work of Young Scott uh, and their partnerships in this area. But I think there's a real need for greater creativity in thinking about how these schemes can be established, expanded and, and crucially sustained, including through the more effective use uh, by credit unions of technology. Deputy President Officer, again, I welcome the fact that uh, we have been able to have this debate uh, this afternoon to allow Parliament the chance, uh, as has uh, already been uh, heard today, to acknowledge the vital role played by credit unions in communities across our country, despite the progress and successes over uh, recent years, however, it's clear more can and must be done to promote the wider use uh, of these credit unions. Efforts to do so, I am uh, confident, will command unanimous support across the chamber, and I confirm Scottish Liberal Democrat support, not just for the government motion, but for Alex Rowley's amendment. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Mr MacArthur. And uh, we now move to the open debate. There is a little time in hand, so there's time for interventions 
or indeed a little over your allocated time. Emphasis on little. Uh, I now call Annabel Ewing, followed by Maurice Corey. Ms Ewing, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'm very pleased indeed to have been uh, called to speak in the debate this afternoon on the vital role that credit unions play in communities right across Scotland and indeed in many, many countries right across the world. As far as Scotland is concerned, as we have heard, there are over 90 credit unions uh, with a combined membership of some 420,000 people. And as the Cabinet Secretary has said, that means that around 7.7% of the population are in fact members of credit unions. Though, I think it is perhaps interesting to note uh, that in the island of Ireland, there are some 351 credit unions and some 3.6 million members. So uh, I, we perhaps still have a way to go, but I think it's fair to recognise that there has been steady progress in Scotland over past years. And it is to be hoped that this debate today uh, and the awareness raising campaign that the Scottish Government recently undertook will help to raise the profile of credit unions even further. For credit unions provide, uh, as we've heard, an invaluable service to the local communities that they serve. They can make available loan funding at affordable rates uh, since they are owned and controlled by the people that use the services of the credit union. They are not banks, presenting officer, witnessed by the fact that any profits are invested straight back into the credit union to keep interest on loans and savings competitive. However, like banks, they are subject to prudential regulation, with the Financial Conduct Authority being a lead regulator. Uh, and so that means that deposits are guaranteed, just as with standard bank deposits, up to a certain threshold. Membership of a credit union is based on, as has been referred to, a common bond, which used to be defined by reference to a geographical area alone, but in fact has widened out in some cases to include, for example, a specific workplace uh, or membership uh, organisation. Presiding officer in my Cowdenbeath constituency, as well as the Kingdom Community Bank uh, Credit Union, already referred to, I am proud to say that there is also the oldest community credit union in Fife, uh, uh, that is the Benarty and Lochelli Credit Union already uh, mentioned. The Benarty and Lochelli Credit Union was established in October 1989 and therefore its 30th anniversary is coming up uh, later uh, this year and I'm sure that uh, members of the credit union would be delighted if the cabinet secretary was able to mark that uh, 30th anniversary in an appropriate way and I'm sure they would love to meet with the cabinet secretary in person and I just thought I would take the opportunity whilst on my feet to, to get that one in. The Bernardi and Lochelli Credit Union has around 2,240 members and the membership, uh, that is the common bond area, is drawn from Belingery, Lahore, Cross Hill and Glen Craig in Bernardi and also from Lochelli. The assets held are currently over £1 million and the share value is around £1.5 million. The maximum amount that can be loaned is £10,000 and the current interest rate is around 12.7%, which represents about 1% per month on a decreasing balance basis. There is no credit check carried out, rather local knowledge plays an important role. There is also very much a feeling that everyone deserves a new chance. So even for example, if someone has been sequestrated in the past, there will still be a consideration as to whether a loan can in fact be made, albeit perhaps at a lower level than originally sought. The Minority and Lochelli Credit Union has in fact proved very successful in terms of its approach to credit management, with bad debt amounting at the end of December 2018 to around £9,000 out of a loan balance of around £675,000. It has also been a trailblazer as far as engagement with young people is concerned, for even before the rollout by the Scottish Government of the very successful Junior Saver Scheme, and can I just take this opportunity to welcome uh, the Cabinet Secretary's announcement of additional funding of some £85,000 uh, and this will help to uh, further extend uh, uh, the rollout of this very successful scheme. But the Bernardi and Lochelli Credit Union had established children's accounts uh, earlier, uh, uh, indeed at Bernardi Primary School and St Kenneth's Primary School and at Lochelli High School. And it has also recently done the same with respect to St Pat's in Lochelli. In fact, in the local area, some children were already members as their grandparents had opened an account for them. Children can be saver members only as it is not until they are 18 that they can borrow money. This focus, I believe, on young people is extremely important as it encourages school pupils to get into the habit of saving and to understand the value of money. 
The credit union is run by a board which is made up of volunteers elected to serve and the current chair is Willie Clark and the treasurer is Donna McEwen. And I had the opportunity to have a chat with each of these founding members of the credit union about the work that they do. And I would wish, presiding officer, to take this opportunity to thank them and their fellow board members and indeed staff for all that they do to help the local community to thrive. And of course, that goes too for all those involved in the Kingdom Community Bank Credit Union. Presiding officer, in bringing my remarks to a close, I would like to stress that regardless of whatever perhaps could be viewed as the key inspiration in the early days of the credit union movement, the Bernardi and Loch Gelly credit union is anything but a poor man's bank. Their membership includes all ages and all walks of life and about as many members are in employment as in retirement or unemployed. Of course, it has to be said that the impact of Westminster austerity on communities such as Benarty and Loch Gelly cannot be underestimated. And uh, indeed, there is a facility for emergency loans from the credit union to help those who, for example, have had the safety net or social security simply removed from them. Presiding officer, I would wish to commend the Bernardi and Loch Gelly credit union for all that they do to help local people and to make their communities more resilient. They are indeed a shining example of people doing it for themselves and for community empowerment generally. And in conclusion, presiding officer, I did promise that I would make a plea today for people in Bernardi and Loch Gelly to consider becoming members of the local credit union as new members are always welcome. And I also promised to make a pitch for anyone in the area who may wish to get involved in the operation of the credit union to consider coming forward to sit on the board. Uh, for young or, or not so young, I would say that your community needs you. Thank you, presiding officer. Close to stretching the definition of a little extra time, but not too bad. Uh, Maurice Corrie to be followed by James Dornan. <coughs> Mr Corrie, Thank please. you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And my apologies uh, for having to leave uh, before the end of this debate's conclusion, which I've had permission to do so, as you're aware. Um, <clears throat> it is indeed a pleasure to join this debate to celebrate the role of the credit unions in Scotland. The credit union movement in our country has been a growing force its development over the years has helped to contribute to our society and more specifically to our local communities. And today there are uh, about 100 credit unions operating in Scotland, as already been mentioned. Uh, these financial cooperatives, together serving over 400,000 Scots, offer loans and saving programs to members who have a common bond. And anyone can pool their resources together and make loans to one another as part of a voluntary cooperative uh, structure, a simple yet impactive ideal. We are here today to appreciate the role of these credit unions in our communities, and I do so gladly. The value of these unions to society is most definitely worthy of note, and in particular, we can all appreciate their nature to promote inclusion. Indeed, as referred to already, anyone can join a credit union as a member, no matter their shared bond, such as the same local area, workplace, association, or trade union. And this bond is the true strength behind the credit union movement, and by encouraging its inclu this inclusivity, people across Scotland can support these financial services alongside each other, whatever their circumstances. Credit unions are molded by its own comp composition, the members themselves. This means that rather than being a heavy focus, having heavy focus on profit, the movement is instead a unique and strong service geared towards members. The fact that they are not only owned but influenced by its members means that this cooperative movement can advance its impact on local communities and its wide-reaching scope for financial assistance. As a credit union member, anyone can take control of their own finances. Surely this shows that by fueling entrepreneurship, Scotland's track record of economic ventures rooted within the community continues to stand out. Through a local lens, more people are becoming active in the economy which in turn has helped to build up areas in which economic activity has been hard to come by. This contributes towards a much needed reduction in equality across Scotland. For those who are perhaps more vulnerable to financial debt, this offers a security and an agency that is their own. The credit union movement encourages a broad scope for financial assistance. They offer a variety of savings accounts and affordable loans that suit individual needs. And this means that members can choose what works for them. The benefits are obvious, with no third-party shareholders, members can enjoy competitive rates of interest on loans and savings accounts, and also saving options. Personally, I've had the privilege of meeting with various local credit unions in my area and have witnessed what they do 
in my area of West Scotland, <clears throat> I see that the professionalism in which these credit unions are handled and perform daily. They highlight a social conscience at their core, which I am pleased to, uh, to see local authorities are in support of. And the security provided by the credit union movement is invaluable to its members. Through its provision of a wide range of loans and savings, people can make some financial control and take it, and also be prepared against any unexpected loss. This security net is a major reason why credit unions' memberships have become more attractive, and the regulation of these unions by the Financial Conduct Authority and the Prudential Regulation Authority means that they are viable and credible. Money within the union is also protected by the Financial Services Compensation Scheme for up to £85,000 per member, and this is equal to the protection offered by building societies and banks, but is a more people-friendly cooperative. This security means that people are protected from the worries of being stuck in a mire of financial debt, and it also guards them against predatory lenders, as we all know. Uh, the UK government has also made moves to make, to, take, to make stricter regulations on payday lending and target illegal lending, which is welcome. This helps to put the members' interests first, and therefore awareness where such a great initiative is underpinned by security has helped this further develop. And surely this shows why credit unions movements deserve to be celebrated. Collaboration is at the heart of why these, union, these credit unions are gaining momentum in Scotland and indeed I'm pleased to see cooperation continue between the Scottish Government and the financial sector. This will help to raise awareness of the movement and encourage more people in Scotland to become members and the UK Government has also made significant efforts to, to have the help the expansion of credit union publicity. And as a veteran, I am especially pleased to see the launch of an Armed Forces Personnel, personnel Credit Union in 2015. Ex-service men and women can find it difficult to accrue solid credit rating with frequent moves, and they can be targeted easily by payday loan groups. But by having this viable and simple alternative to building societies and banks, Armed Forces personnel have the opportunity to make savings and find affordable loans to make life easier. And in celebrating credit unions, I know that it is our shared hope of greater awareness of their benefit. And the collaboration between the UK and Scottish Government has encouraged publicity of what the movement offers. And the fact that there are £511 million in savings for Scottish members shows that we should promote, this, should promote this avenue of financial management. It is abundantly worthwhile. And not only does it help people, but it encourages to make better understanding of the best way to manage our money. And while Scotland has a good track record of membership, this is more to be done to make this much higher. And it truly it makes a thriving economic, economically active communities and also Scotland's credit union movement needs this awareness. And to conclude, finally, Deputy Presiding Officer, I welcome this appreciated community of the credit unions today and they place members at the centre and encourage an ethos of sustainability, inclusivity and security. And I hope this debate will encourage the profile this movement needs for their positive impact on communities is quite obviously clear. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Corey. I call James Dornan to be followed by Kezia Dugdale. Mr. Dornan, please. I've been a member of a credit union for over 20 years. I'm delighted to take part in this debate today. People of Glasgow have, just like me, trusted and used the credit union to borrow, save and manage their money in a healthy fashion. They have always been a trusted financial organisation known for always putting their members first. As has been said earlier on, we live in an era of payday lenders and fast money. Now, when I get money from the credit union, and I do occasionally take it out. I uh, usually use it for holidays or for doing something, an upgrade in the house or whatever. But the internet and TV and newspapers are flooded with adverts for loans to help people get by. And I once recently read an article in The Guardian that indicated that 57% of those who took out a payday loan used the money to pay for day-to-day -day items, such as household bills, clothes, and even food. And with more and more people suffering under the current social security arrangements, it's no surprise that people take such desperate measures to get by. With the rollout of universal credit, this is only due to get worse, but I will touch upon that later. However, these payday loans are a curse on many of my constituents, and the credit union is one real source of hope. The credit union in Castlemilk in my constituency is not just a financial hub, but also a cornerstone of the community. It's a safe, well-recognised organisation which provides valuable service to the community. The manager of the branch, Elizabeth, has herself been aware of and subsequently a member of credit unions for 43 years. Growing up in the East End of Glasgow, her parents were not just advocates for the work of the credit unions, but pioneers who fought to bring them to Scotland. Her passion is clear to all who meet her because she really believes in the result they get when assisting people with financial planning and often at times changing poor financial habits. 
And the credit union doesn't just provide fantastic interest rates, but also a real financial education to local people. For example, if you take out a loan, be it for personal purposes or to consolidate debt on repayment, the member is also required to pay in at least £10 per month to a savings account. This not only helps members climb out of the horrendous debt to which they may have found themselves in, but also can help the future need to avoid borrowing should the unexpected happen. And it's amazing just how often the unexpected does occur for many of my constituents. As we discussed earlier, fast money is a real problem and can often plunge the most vulnerable in society into a financial black hole to which they feel they can never escape. And we should be thankful that the credit unions across Scotland are providing a real financial alternative. It also gives a fantastic service to those members who are in receipt of a social security benefit. Elizabeth, Elizabeth explained that with the post office no longer able to assist as previously, that much of their traditional role has fallen to them. So with the agreement of the user, a portion of the benefit can be taken and used to pay back loans, another portion placed in member savings and the rest allocated for daily living. Once again, teaching members how to prioritize any incoming money. This extra burden for credit unions at times can bring its own unique issues and requires a further commitment from staff to those most vulnerable. Elizabeth told me that many of our members have major problems with literacy and are un unable to understand some basic forms, not only presented by us, but from the DWP. My staff are committed to our members and often spend hours at a time on the phone to the DWP on members' behalf to ensure that no stone is left unturned when it comes to an individual's financial situation. I'm sure you'll all agree this is customer service at its best. The Scottish Government's People Not Profit campaign was brilliant for raising awareness of the many services mentioned above. After the banks caused such financial turmoil across the UK, it is about time we put people first. But unfortunately, even the credit unions can face real difficulties. The Bank of England have, has increased the credit union's capital adequacy from 1% to 3%, putting real pressure on many of the branches, including Casamilk, and that is why the Carnegie UK Trust's investment of £1 million will be most welcome. Sadly, financial pressures are not the only pressures being faced by staff. The rollout of universal credit has been a real challenge. Elizabeth explains that when a member's money is paid directly to a branch, it can be very difficult to establish who the recipient is. And if it wasn't for her wonderful staff, it would be almost impossible to ensure that it was allocated properly. Recipients must bring proof, and as we discussed earlier, if there are literacy issues, this can be a real problem to the many users. Presiding officer, the rollout of universal credits having a catastrophic effect in areas like Casamilk. And we should also be thankful, we should all be thankful for the committed organisations who are trying in earnest to mitigate the worst of the impact that the coal face. It's been said many times that the only two certainties in life are death and taxes, and sadly, neither a topic which brings much joy to the chamber but I really did want to make an important final point about another service provided by the credit unions. If you're over 65 and pass away with £5,000 or more in your savings, a credit union will double that when it is paid out to families. Alongside that, any debt held will be wiped out. And this is an incredible insurance for members who would at times be unable to leave anything to grieving families, especially when life assurance isn't a predominant financial priority. Right officer, the credit union has been in my constituency for 29 years and has borrowed over £30 million to members. If that was loaned by even some of the more established loan companies, the people would have had to pay back over £300 million. So not only do credit unions employ local people, provide a face-to-face -face service and financial education, they're a real source of hope for many people hoping to escape from a financial quagmire. And finally, President Officer, I wish to finish by thanking each and every staff member, volunteer and manager within the credit union movement and look forward to this parliament, as has been shown today, and this government continuing to support the invaluable work they do for many years to come. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Dornan. And I call Kezia Dugdale to be followed by Angela Constance. Ms Dugdale, please. Thank you, President Officer. And if I can start by declaring uh, a number of uh, interests. I'm a member of Capital Credit Union, a member of Castle Community Bank, and as a co-op sponsored MSP, I believe fundamentally in cooperatives, and in particular, see credit unions not just as some sort of coothy feel-good service, but as a serious mainstream alternative to a number of uh, other financial uh, options and institutions. And when I was first elected um, as a fresh-faced and optimistic MSP, uh, I set up a campaign called Debt Busters, which served three purposes. It sought to take on uh, payday lenders street by street. It sought to improve debt relief mechanisms here in the Parliament. And it also sought to promote the alternative, and that alternative was credit unions. 
And when I reflect on that campaign five years on, I think we did make some substantial progress in some areas. One of the first things we did was take to the streets of Leith, and I did that with Councillor Gordon Munro, uh, where at the time there were no less than 11 payday lenders within two minutes' walk of the Kirkgate. There are now just three. We would set up street stalls in the high street. We had a shark costume uh, to demonstrate the dangers uh, of these lenders. And I've got to say that Councillor Gordon Monroe's fared far better than that shark costume it has five years on. Uh, so we've made substantial progress there. Big companies like Wonga, uh, which were at the time charging 4,000, 4, I'm sorry, 4,000 percent APRs, are on the verge of bankruptcy and no longer offering the types of financial products which ruined people's lives back in the day. And our sites are now set on alternative financial services like Bright House, who, who perhaps don't charge 4,000 APR, but in charging 160 or 200% APR for white goods cause families up and down the country tremendous amounts of debt pressure. The second aspect of the campaign was around improving debt relief. And I think we made a lot of progress here in the parliament about introducing fast track DASs, debt assistance schemes, to make sure that we would freeze people's uh, interest in the debts that they had at the minute that they applied for assistance, rather than waiting to the point that they were at the cusp of bankruptcy to freeze that interest. And I pay credit to the government for uh, listening to the campaign at that time, and indeed in taking the advice of uh, Mike Daly, who uh, led this charge on behalf of uh, the Govan Law Centre. The third part of the campaign was about promoting that alternative uh, uh, and that alternative being credit unions and although we've made some progress in that time, arguably nowhere near as much as we should have done. And I think it's really important to recognise that there are a multitude of different types of credit unions with objectives uh, of their own which we need to respect. There are some credit unions that desperately want to offer an alternative to payday loans. And I think the first uh, uh, credit union to do that was Blantyre Credit Union back in 2013. They had a product called the Swift 500, which allowed people to uh, access up to £500 on the same day that they went into their credit union uh, and got it. And they did a really interesting bit um, of analysis in terms of how that went. So in the first year of that project, um, 2,900 people in the Blantyre area borrowed £500 from the credit union uh, rather than from Wonga. And they were able to establish that that actually meant that they'd saved half a million pounds within that community because of the difference in interest that was paid between the credit union and what they would have cost if they'd gone to Wonga. That's half a million pounds back into that particular community that could be spent on local services and in the local economy. And they were also able to further demonstrate that of that £500,000, £113,000 of it actually went back into the credit union in the form of savings. People were able for the first time to put money aside and guarantee themselves uh, the financial security that was so uh, often absent. I think we also need to recognise, though, that some credit unions think the whole concept of a payday loan is fundamentally wrong, that it's unsustainable, and they don't want to offer those products, and we shouldn't ask them to. They, they don't have to do that. So I think in whatever support we have uh, and we offer credit unions, we need to recognise uh, their right to operate in the ways that they want to that reflect their local circumstances. One of the other major changes that's happened in that time is the amount of money that uh, credit unions have had access to to develop and advance their IT capability. Uh, credit unions needed the ability to have online banking facilities to appeal to the types of people that should be uh, using credit unions as a service. And I think there was something like uh, £33 million provided by the UK government to make sure credit unions had access to that IT capability. But the very minute that they had that capability, the financial sector moved on and the way that we bank moved on. And I think very few people in this room would say that they uh, sign on to a desktop computer to look at their online bank account. They're far more likely to do it on their mobile phone. And credit unions are miles behind high street banks in terms of having mobile phone technology. And actually, consistently, credit unions are behind the curve when it comes to this technological uh, advance. And of course they are, because they don't have the capacity of the high street banks to invest the development money into things like this, which is where the government here in Scotland and indeed the UK government can step in uh, and assist. And I would encourage them um, to do more of that. There are, of course, other high street issues. I think we could do a lot more to help credit unions establish a presence on the high street. I mentioned the Kirkgate and Leith. When we were uh, campaigning there five years ago, there were numerous uh, high street banks that are no longer there, um, that have closed since. But I'm delighted to see Castle Community Bank set up uh, an office uh, on the Leith High Street that was opened by Angela Constance and Michael Sheen uh, in her capacity as Cabinet Secretary not so long ago. 
Equally, when TSB and the Bank of Scotland closed in Craig Miller, Castle Community Bank moved in and they have a premise opposite the neighbourhood centre where most people would go to access council services. But I think more credit unions could do that if they had the assistance from the local authority and indeed the government to do that. That could mean rent reductions, it could mean rates relief, it could mean so many other things. I appreciate my, my time is running out, uh, presiding officer, but if I could say to the cabinet secretary, uh, her and I are of similar ages and uh, I hope therefore that she remembers Super Squirrel, which was an initiative uh, of the Bank of Scotland, uh, where you were you got lots of cuddly toys and uh, money in your account if you opened up a savings account as a kid with the Bank of Scotland. That's the type of thing we should be enabling credit unions to do, and that's why Labour is so keen to see the Scottish Government put some financial resource behind setting up and opening credit union accounts for young people so that they learn at an early age that they can, can and should save uh, for their mutual benefit. So I'll, I'll close there, presiding officer, but to, just to say, as long as we continue to have that vision of credit unions as a mainstream alternative to high street banks, then we should share that ambition with the resources that we put in to achieve that goal. Thank you. I'm advised you actually got a squirrel. I, I didn't know that. I'm advised here that you oh, seem to know all about it. Uh, call Angela Constance, who followed by Jeremy Butler. Not a real squirrel, of course. Sorry, a little, yes. Uh, call, call Angela Constance, followed by Jeremy Balfour, please. Miss Constance. Thank you very much, President Officer. Uh, given that this week has been dominated by all things Brexit, it is uh, an uplifting opportunity to be able to participate in a debate celebrating uh, the achievements of the credit union movement in Scotland. And I remember the day after the EU referendum when I was thoroughly depressed and wanted to greet, amongst other things, but I had to get up out of my bed because uh, I was due to attend an event organised by West Lothian Credit Union who were celebrating the significant milestone that they had reached of lending out £10 million uh, to the West Lothian community. And today, uh, West Lothian uh, Credit Union, over their 20-year uh, history, has lent out £13 million to the West Lothian community and they have to be congratulated uh, for that and when we consider Scotland's 90 plus credit unions they have 350 million pounds out on loan uh, to members currently so clearly credit unions make a massive contribution to tackling inequality but they have both the desire and the potential to do so much more uh, with the right uh, support. And the Cabinet Secretary spoke about how uh, credit unions are developing products, for example, to assist uh, with uh, funeral poverty. And some of the products that uh, West Lothian Credit Union, who I'm very proud to be a member of, some of the products that they have developed is the, their own cash tray savings schemes. Uh, again, you know, uh, other credit unions have done likewise. Um, they have also set up prior communities in memory of the late Father Jerry uh, Pryor. This is the charity arm of West Lothian Credit Union. Uh, and this funds their excellent financial education program uh, in uh, West Lothian schools. And they uh, are, are aiming to build upon the, the existing 1,300 uh, junior savers who um, I don't think any of them have been given a squirrel, uh, but I suspect many of them have been given West Lothian Credit Union piggy banks, which is perhaps far more um, appropriate. And they have, as a credit union, so many other projects, the Jam Jar project for vulnerable people on, on benefits, and also their, their Choices Loan project, which helps people pay off high charging payday lenders uh, or indeed uh, overdraft. So given the contribution uh, that credit unions uh, do make, uh, our core focus should be on supporting credit unions to grow uh, their membership. And we've heard from the Cabinet Secretary that because membership is based on the common bond, every resident in Scotland uh, would qualify to join at least one credit union. So therefore, perhaps it is time to set some ambitious targets about dramatically increasing uh, the, the portion uh, of our population uh, who have credit union uh, membership. There should be no lapse into complacency just because 7% of the population of Scotland are a member compared to 2% in England and Wales. 
And as I uh, said yesterday in a debate on a completely different matter, I can't be bothered with the uh, two-dimensional comparisons between Scotland and the rest of the UK, when actually we should be setting uh, our ambitions and our sights much higher and based uh, always on the best international practice. And we've heard from Annabelle Yoon today uh, about the, the, the Irish um, experience. So clearly increasing membership uh, of the movement would make the movement more sustainable. And to do that, uh, we need to do three things. Firstly, as many others throughout this debate have said, uh, we need to increase further the opportunities uh, for payroll deductions and build on the good work uh, that's been undertaken already. And uh, what I would suggest to the Cabinet Secretary, if this doesn't already exist, um, I wonder um, if she would consider an action plan that really promotes and monitors over time uh, the goals of increasing membership levels and increasing opportunities uh, for payroll deductions right across the public sector, the private sector and also uh, the third sector. And secondly, uh, the Cabinet Secretary should be commended uh, for the, the credit union awareness campaign. It is very important to get across that credit unions uh, are for everyone and they're not just the, the, the poor man's uh, bank. And I do think in our consumer savvy uh, society that if more people knew that uh, deposits in credit unions are protected up to £85,000 per person under the financial services compensation scheme, exactly the same protection that's available to deposits in banks and building societies, that more people from all walks of life uh, would join. And the third issue is, I think, the issue of supporting capacity within the credit unions, as Kezia Dugdale has intimated, uh, for example, through technology and capital investment is crucially, crucially important. And I will acknowledge the work that the government is undertaking in partnership with the Carnegie Trust in this regard. However, we do have another opportunity to strengthen the movement by enabling credit unions to access financial transactions. And this is an issue that I've raised uh, directly with the Finance Secretary when he was at the Economy Committee, and I've since written to him and other ministers uh, in detail. Now, the Welsh Government use financial transactions to help credit unions boost uh, their regulatory reserves, uh, but there would be other potential uses of financial transactions too and the Welsh Government has also earmarked a modest amount of financial transactions, a million pounds over two years, specifically for credit unions and in this instance for, for, for loans. So I really hope that the, the Cabinet Secretary will explore this potential with the Finance Secretary too, uh, given that credit unions are also referenced in the Tackling Child Poverty Delivery Plan, Every Child, Every Chance. Um, and Mr Mackay did say that he would give the matter uh, some consideration. So I hope uh, uh, Ms uh, Campbell will also go and uh, annoy him as well in the same way that I have. So to conclude, President Officer, I really just want to make a heartfelt uh, contribution uh, and pay tribute uh, to uh, the West Lothian Credit Union and the other credit unions, the length and breadth of Scotland, that work day in, day out to make Scotland fairer. Thank you. Jeremy Balfour, followed by Bill Kidd. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer, and can I uh, thank the Government for bringing this debate forward, and also uh, um, uh, it's a pleasure to follow two other Lovian MSPs. I think it shows the, the quality of Lovian that we have three speakers in a row uh, speaking in this debate. Um, I, I think there is consensus in this debate, and obviously coming uh, slightly later on, it is sometimes uh, difficult to find new points to make. But I, I do think it is something that is worth spending some time talking about and reflecting on and, and seeing how we can do things better. Uh, last year, I had the, the privilege to uh, travel to Rwanda, where credit union banks um, are starting to be based in the local community to allow people to, to save and then borrow, um, as they can do here in Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom. I think there is support uh, for uh, the way forward from both UK and Scottish government. And I, and I agree with um, other speakers that we shouldn't uh, be limiting our ambition. Yes, we are doing well com compared to England. Uh, we have a way to go in regard to, to Northern Ireland. And I think we should be setting um, our sights high and encouraging people from different backgrounds um, with different needs uh, to be putting money into these types of banking. If I can, just for um, a few moments, uh, maybe focus in 
um, on older and disabled people. Because we've heard uh, talk of uh, younger people, uh, people who come from other backgrounds. But I think there is um, a real benefit in this type of banking for those of us who are older and disabled. Um, I had uh, the privilege a couple of weeks ago um, of visiting Age Scotland um, to talk to them about some of the issues um, that their members um, are facing um, and was uh, slightly shocked to find uh, that I now am in that age range of aged Scotland. Um, but I think one of the first advantages that we get is that it is a safe alternative to other types of banking. Age Scotland, Age UK have run a campaign over a number of years in regard to financial scams that often affect older people in Scotland. And I think the security um, of uh, a different type of banking um, allows older people to know that their money is safe, as the previous speaker has talked about, that there is that guarantee that your money is safe um, up to a fairly high amount. I think the, the second advance is that, again, as, as previous speakers have spoken about, is that it's a good way in what around fairer loans. That the, the loans that people will give are, are monitored and looked at. It is community-based, and you can pay back that amount of money um, in small amounts over a period of time. And again, if I can just reflect back on my experience in Rwanda, that is one of the major advantages that they find, that local communities, often people who really do not have a lot, are able to put a little in every week or every month. And then when they want to start a business or expand their business, they can get loans that can be afforded and can then be repaid back. Um, I think the third advantage that these types of bankers, and, and it's almost the opposite of what Kedja Dugdale said, it's, it's almost not a contradiction, uh, but it's uh, perhaps a reflection of something slightly different, is that a lot of them, or most banks, don't have internet banking. And again, for those with disability or those who are older, that can be an advantage. Uh, I'm afraid that I have got to that age that I don't like internet banking. Uh, I still like going in to see the eyeballs of a bank individual. And I think that is an advantage. But actually, if we look at the, 19, the 2016 survey, Deputy Presiding Officer, 67% of older people still didn't have internet access in their homes or found it easy to find. And many older people do want to go in for the sociability, for the security into a bank and be able to do the transactions face to face. So yes, I can understand um, Kezia Douglas' comments about seeking to expand it uh, onto iPhones and onto net. But I think we also have to make sure that that local bank that's in a local community that people can walk, can walk to and benefit from is kept at the same time to allow a, a mixture of economies so that people that want different styles get. Absolutely. Kezia Dugdale. Thank you, Mr. Officer. I just want to emphasise I agree wholeheartedly with the point that he's making. I wonder, therefore, uh, given that he'd like to see credit unions set up on high streets, whether he would agree with Labour that we could do more to support them in doing that by perhaps offering rates relief or reduced rents in order to allow something which can't automatically compete with high street banks do so in this way. Jeremy Balfour. Yeah, I mean, I think it's something absolutely that we should look at, uh, and particularly in communities where banks are leaving. You know, we have all, across I'm sure this chamber, have been faced within our local communities of perhaps the bigger banks closing and leaving nobody there. And I think it can be an alternative, or not even an alternative, it can be a competition to the mainstream banks. And I think we should encourage that and look at ways of doing that. So if I can uh, conclude, Dr. Provider Officer, again, for thanking uh, the government for this debate, I think both the UK and Scottish government are working well on this together. I would encourage that to continue. And I think we do need to make sure that we protect uh, vulnerable people, that they can feel safe when they're doing the banking. Thank you. Bill Kidd, followed by Johan Lamont. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the topic of this debate, the role of credit unions within local economies and their capacity to help communities, is something that really does deserve discussion here in the Scottish Parliament. 
Engaging in this debate requires us to look at the mechanics of the Scottish economy and whether these work in practice for the people of Scotland. I've got a conviction that a strong economy is not marked by GDP alone. Rather, a strong Scottish economy is one where our neighbours are able to afford food, housing, energy, childcare and all financial fundamentals required to get through day-to-day -day life. This means not having to rely on payday lenders, nor does it mean being trapped in a cycle of debt. Good governance equates to policies that reduce inequality and therefore lead to a stronger Scottish economy and stronger Scottish communities, and that's my belief. I believe that the Scottish Government's promotion of competitive and responsible lending through credit unions is a fine example of this. So how do credit unions make a difference to the people of Scotland and why is this a relevant issue today? Credit unions, as has been touched on by many who have spoken um, before me, are community-based organisations that offer membership to people who share something in common. This could be the area you live in, the industry you work in, or being a member of a trade union. One example from my, my Glasgow Annie's Land constituency is from Chapel Credit Union, which next year celebrates serving communities in the west of Glasgow for 50 years. Credit unions are not-for-profit organisations that offer financial products and follow strong guiding principles of responsible lending. They offer loans, cash ISAs and current accounts, amongst other products, for loans, they are capped at an APR of roughly 42.6%. However, more often than not, they lend at a lower rate than this, compared to payday lenders who are capped at 1,500% APR. This is obviously significantly better. However, constituents may find that banks often offer loans on 3% APR for those, but only for those who, first of all, qualify for an account. APR is the real amount you will have to pay, including the compound interest and any additional costs accrued over the year. So it's very important that people making a credit application consider this cost. It is essential that people find the most competitive rate of APR available to them and only seek out credit where they can afford to pay it back. And that's where credit unions come in. For those who are not able to access the headline rates of products offered by high street lenders like the banks, credit unions may be able to offer a competitive loan. Responsible and fair credit lending is the most crucial thing here. Before applying for a loan, credit unions, as is in the case in my constituency, will often require members to save first. And why is all of this so relevant today? In 2016, the Money Advice Service found that four in 10 adults across the UK did not have £500 or more in savings. This £500 is a crucial amount that is often called buffer savings. While it's not always possible, working towards having £500 saved can make the difference of being able to afford unexpected expenses. Credit unions can offer a good and supported way for people to build up this amount of savings. Saving £42 a month would give you a savings buffer of £500 within a year. The reality is, however, that reaching this is difficult for many people. In 2016, Mass Catchy produced research indicating that 48.4% of adults in Scotland have less than £100 in savings. That is almost half the people of Scotland. In this circumstance, any small amount, even five or ten pounds a month, put into a regular savings account will make a difference over time. I think it's important to mention the free advice that is available from debt charity. Step Change is one debt charity that works in Scotland to provide free debt advice to anyone who needs it. And I'd recommend that anyone struggling with debt speak to debt Step Change or another approved debt charity as soon as possible. They can either help you consolidate your debts or arrange an affordable payment plan. These plans often freeze any interest on debt. People with less than £100 or £500 in savings may have to seek out credit to pay for unforeseen and unavoidable costs. In this context, credit unions are a much safer and fairer alternative to payday lenders. Due to their onus on responsible lending, they can provide credit and often give one-to-one -one support that helps avoid creating a cycle of debt. Presiding officer, I'd like to end by reiterating the importance of safe and fair alternatives for people seeking out credit who are not able to access high street offers. These must be competitive 
and they must be responsible. When we see, not only see debt being reduced, but individuals being able to accumulate money that is set aside to help in times of emergency or cash flows or just day-to-day -day living, we will see a fairer society. The role of credit unions is providing a viable and fairer alternative to payday lenders and it's vital to many. I thank them for their current approach and its consistency in this effort and for their positive impact on our many constituents' lives right across Scotland. Thank you very much. Joanne Lamont, followed by David Torrance. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm grateful for the opportunity to contribute to this debate. I should declare an interest as a cooperative MSP. The Scottish Co-op Party is committed to building support for and sustaining cooperative initiatives in the economy, in education, public services and in our communities. And I'm proud of the role of credit unions in supporting individuals and families, the work of volunteers who make real every day their commitment to changing lives, and proud too of the pioneering and creative work of credit unions across Scotland and internationally. Initiatives not decided by government, but imagined and created by a movement with a proud history and as relevant today as ever it was. This debate may be consensual, but we make a mistake if we imagine that the credit union movement is cosy or comfortable. Credit unions have challenged and continue to challenge what may be perceived as the normal way of doing things. A normal that has too often been predatory, exploitative of vulnerable people, and working from a business model that relies on encouraging people to make financial decisions that are against their own interests. We need to ensure we do all we can to support credit unions to offer a genuine alternative to these dubious practices. Any study of the work of credit unions reveal ambition, pioneering approaches on saving, reliable borrowing and budgeting, increasing, fina increasing financial confidence. I've been privileged to see the work of credit unions across Glasgow and I am in awe of their collective energy. The example of Pollock Credit Union is instructive. It saw huge growth when it was given the opportunity to be located in Pollock Shopping Centre. There is visibility, the fact that it looked like a bank premises, its accessibility gave increasing numbers of people the confidence to become members. And I would ask the Scottish Government how it might consider, through reduced rents and rates relief, how we, how we might see more credit unions visible on our high streets and how public buildings, community centres, police stations, housing offices, for example, might host credit unions in order to increase customer access and reach. And this matters more broadly. It's not unusual for shopping areas to be dominated by betting shops and payday loan companies, which all too often suck up money out of local communities in stark contrast to credit unions which generate and sustain local income and investment. Now I'm proud of Labour's record in power in supporting credit unions, building capacity at a local level, allowing a greater range of services to be developed. And I would urge the Scottish Government to endorse in full the Association of British Credit Unions Charter, a credit union nation, as a means of building on the work that has gone before. We should support credit unions in being able to deliver more banking services. And I think the points made by my colleague, Kez Dugdale, in this regard are critical. We need to give them the means to deliver these services in the modern world. It's essential that there is continuing education on the role of credit unions. I welcome the payroll initiative in our own amendment. And indeed, it was an early decision in the Scottish Parliament that's meant that I have um, a credit union um, a bank account from which um, my salary goes into every month. I note the initiatives to give young people credit union accounts. Neil Finlay. In, in terms of the, the, the Parliament system, uh, is that, um, does she have a choice as to which credit union that goes into? Joanne I don't Lamont. know whether there's a choice. I, just took, I think initially it was a, a partnership with Capital Credit Union. That may be something that uh, the colleagues might want to look at. But it was a very important initiative at the time, signalling the importance of credit unions, not just to people in impoverished and disadvantaged communities, but to people in work. Um, I, I note the initiatives to support young people, giving them credit union accounts, but I do exercise some concern about the impact of local authority cuts um, on budgets and the capacity of local authorities to continue these kind of initiatives. And I would hope that the government would reflect on that too. 
There is no doubt that learning early about savings and financial awareness reduces the capacity of exploitative financial offers to be accepted. And I would like to make the broader point on education on the cooperative model as an important, not marginal, part of the economic landscape. It cannot be right that a student of economics can go through school, college and university without being taught about the cooperative economic model. And in conclusion, may I seek a commitment from the Cabinet Secretary to be open-minded and inquiry, inquiring about some of the barriers to sustainability and development that credit unions themselves have identified, and we've heard of some of them in the debate already. As an example, credit unions highlighted their concerns at a recent cross-party group on credit unions meeting about the impact on them of the current procedures around debt arrangement schemes and debt management initiatives, and the way in which credit unions can be excluded from consultation on debt plans with massive consequences for them, which would be worrying in the longer term. I would be grateful if the Cabinet Secretary could confirm her willingness to meet with credit unions, perhaps along with the cross-party group, to discuss this very important issue. It is, of course, great to recognise, celebrate and applaud credit unions, but it is also a good time to take stock and ensure we do all we can to harness their huge potential to serve the people of Scotland and to ensure that our young people understand exactly what they're doing um, in a world where too often the business model is, uh, creates exploitation rather than a safe place for young people and others to save. Thank you. David Torrance, followed by Tom Mason. Thank you, President Officer. I'd like to welcome the Government's motion and the valuable role that credit unions play in all our constituencies. As we have heard, credit union membership in Scotland is growing. There are 94 credit unions and almost 330,000 members, which means that 7.3% of the Scottish population is enrolled in a credit union. In fact, we are extremely fortunate to have the volunteer-led Kingdom Credit Union, who believe in the deliverance of a fairer fife, a fife where all residents have the capability to live good lives, make choices and reach their full potential, and where all the children are safe, happy and healthy. With a number of collection points across Fife, they ensure their service can be easily accessed by everyone, particularly those that may not have access to a traditional, traditional bank account, and so therefore have limited choices when it comes to borrowing. During a recent visit to a local credit union in the Lynx area of Kirkcaldy, I sat and spoke with volunteers and some of their clients and heard the extremely moving story of one of the team buying the motivation for ensuring everyone in the community, no matter what their financial position, had access to affordable credit. I heard how some several years ago, a well-known and well-respected man in the local area found himself in short-term financial difficulty and in desperation approached a loan shark. The amount he borrowed was only £10, but it was to have devastating consequences. One week later, when he found himself unable to repay the full £10, it was doubled to 20 by an unscrupulous lender. The next week, it was increased again, and so on and so on, trapping the gentleman in a cycle of debt that continued to escalate and over which he had no control and no way of escaping. He was trapped and could see no way out. The level of debt had become so high that despite his best efforts, he was facing an amount that he would never be able to settle. At first, the pressure to pay and the threats which may happen if he didn't were solely directed to him. But this behaviour soon escalated and included his wife. Then the most unimaginable thing for a parent happened. His children became the victims of taunts, intimidation and violence in the playground and out in the streets. This family felt so fearful but in the middle of the night, they packed up two, two suitcases and left. They left behind their home and their belongings. They left behind their friends. They left behind the community they had been born and bred in. They left because of £10. I heard how it was at this moment that they vowed to make sure that no one else in this tight-knit community ever found themselves trapped in such a desperate situation. The campaign and fight took several years, but two years ago, their determination saw their wish become reality. In these two years since its inception, over 500 people within the local, local community have become members and regularly benefit from the services provided. And in the community with a population of 3,000, this is highly impressive and illustrates just how quickly it has become an integral part of the neighbourhood. Talking with them, it was clear to see why the community, the credit union, has become so popular as it was well used, because it was run by a small team of volunteers who live locally and an enormous level of trust exists between them and their clients. Trust not only encourages membership, but gives individuals the confidence to speak open and freely, enabling the right support and advice to be given. 
In a time when many towns have suffered from bank closures and the withdrawal of face-to-face -face services from local communities all across Scotland, the services provided by credit unions have never been more important. For the most vulnerable in our, within our communities, when it comes to discussing financial matters, the importance of a personal engagement and face-to-face -face contact cannot be overstated. Several of the clients I spoke to have highlighted the vital life round provided by a credit union during the recent times caused by universal credit. As we all know, thousands of families across Scotland have been left with no income for many weeks. And I fear many more families in my constituency would be facing even greater hardship if it was not for the help and advice from financial support provided by a credit union. How many children have gone without food, heat or necessary clothing? How many parents would have found themselves dragged into an unmanageable situation due to having no other option than to borrow from an unscrupulous lender or access alternative credit and end up paying excessive rates of interest on loans? An important function of a credit union, along with many others, is giving advice, from budgeting to implications of borrowing. By being proactive and educating, we encourage members to budget and to consider setting up saving plans, tailoring each to individuals' needs, with members able to choose how much or how little they want to save. These small changes can often build a level of stability that can make a hugely positive difference and affect their life. Figures from the Scottish Household Survey show that 9% of owners or occupiers report having no savings while 49% of socially rented households report having no savings. These are the people who are more far, far more likely to be dependent on credit and with access to affordable credit can often find themselves in a spiral of uncontrollable debt, which can often lead to far more serious problems. Those in our communities without financial resilience to withstand any unexpected rent, be it a major repair in their household or a change to Bennett, should not be penalised. Lastly, I would like to highlight a recent announcement from NHS Fife that our staff will now have the opportunity to become members of the NHS Credit Union. Founded 20 years ago, the NHS Credit Union has gone from strength to strength and currently offers a wide range of financial services to over 17,500 NHS employees and family members. I believe that over, over, over the coming weeks there will be a number of roadshows held across Fife which will give the staff the opportunity to learn more about the services provided and the benefits of becoming a member. And I would encourage staff to head along to one and find out more. In conclusion, President Officer, Scotland's credit unions have a vulnerable role throughout Scotland, valuable role throughout Scotland, and I very much welcome the People's Not Profit campaign and continued investment in the credit union sector to ensure a fair and accessible provision to financial services and products to every single person in Scotland. Therefore, by protecting those in our communities who are financially disadvantaged from predatory lenders and unmanageable debt, it is vital that we continue to support the development and growth of credit unions in Scotland. I'd also like to offer my thanks to all the volunteers that support the credit unions within my constituency who give up their valuable time to provide their expertise and experience it for the benefit of local communities. Tom Mason, followed by Willie Coffey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Long time ago, before the, before the world was round, I was a junior engineer on a construction site and I had to borrow from, from the box and, and make contributions to the box. I never understood quite what it was, but latterly I learned it was a beginnings of a credit union in a very crude form as they were then. And I'm also sure that in this chamber there's more people who have knowledge of credit, details of credit unions than I do. But I do recognise across the country that not just as a viable alternative to the play they load at culture, that alter... Uh, Credit unions are recognised across the country not just as a viable alternative to payday loan culture that has regrettably expanded to recent years, but as an ethical low interest source of finance for those who may have found other avenues clo closed to them. Now, around one in 13 in people in Scotland are involved in credit unions, and we can see that more than 20% of all credit unions in the UK are Scottish. This is, I think, a ringing endorsement of the relevance and performance today. Fundamentally, this is down to the excellent level of service and credit unions can provide, whether it is saving for a car, a wedding, or even buying a house. These community organisations can always help. The importance of these services is even more so when we consider the context of the wider financial inclusion. One of the key problems for the people, particularly on lower incomes, can be meeting the criteria and conditions for a bank loan. Often banks simply don't take the risk or when they do, they can set much higher interest rates. 
And if somebody is rejected for a bank loan, the alternatives are even more unpalatable. Pay payday lendings, with which members will be familiar, can charge APR percentage rates well into the thousands, and leaving the cost of important pro projects painfully high. So when the credit unions can offer loans at rates of between 2 and 3% per month, it is clear that clients with, uh, might be seen as a risky financial profile get a much better deal, delivering on greater financial inclusion across Scotland. As far as my own region goes, we are lucky to have a number of different credit unions providing for local people. In Aberdeen, for example, we have a Grampian Credit Union and a St Marker Credit Union providing for people with, with a stake in the development of their local communities. Most importantly, we must make it a priority to widen access to the credit unions, ensuring that people across the country, in every walk of life, know that they have opportunity to be members and, and use their services, not just through workplaces or trade unions, but any, any organisation which is available to them. To that end, I am pleased that credit unions have been recognised and supported by initiatives both here in Hollywood, Hollywood and by the UK government. The Department of Work and Pension set up the credit union expansion project in 2013 with a 38 million investment with an aim of increasing the availability of financial services to those on lower incomes. And in this parliament, the Scottish Government introduced a working group on credit unions in 2014 whose 2016 report, Investing in Our Future, set out a number of recommendations to help develop the sector in the years ahead. This is the work that has been continued with the People Not Profit initiative launched by ministers towards the end of last year. This is welcome and I look forward to seeing these efforts come to fruition. Now as we welcome the effort going forward, it is important to compare where we are now with goals set previously. In many ways, good progress is made I am pleased the membership of the credit union is steadily increasing. Proportionally, more people in Scotland are members of credit unions than anywhere else in the UK, and we would build that up, and we should build on that. However, the scale of lending needs much more. We lag behind Northern Ireland, for instance, in the portion of total UK lending. I note that the, the, the concern comments from the Association of British Credit Unions, that the range of services that can be provided is currently restricted and that membership, whilst above the UK average, is still relatively low. It is without mentioning the example set by the United States where 44% of economically active people are members. This just goes to show the benefits of credit unions being an institutional norm rather than a last resort for some. For some. So this is where we are, presiding officer. We have, I think, support across Parliament for the important role of credit unions in improving financial inclusion, as well as the political will to see changes made where they need to be in order to meet the goals. Credit unions do a great work among our communities, and our church groups, our workplaces and, so, and many more places. They play a vital role on the path to better financial inclusion across the country and deliver a, a sustainable financial option for those that may struggle to find them at a reasonable cost elsewhere. So I welcome the progress already made and look forward to seeing further such developments in the weeks and months to come. So, so that the common bond of credit union can be extended to more the, the, those who need it. But in closing, presiding officer, I think we must remember he, he, Henry Duncan, born in 1774 in Dumfries, who was the founder of the savings bank movement, which we haven't had a mention of as yet. So I do so now. Thank you very much. Willie Coffey, followed by Ruth McGuire. Thanks very much, President Officer. I'm genuinely pleased to be able to speak in the debate, even near the end, when quite a lot of the ground has already been covered by other <laughs> colleagues. But it doesn't matter because I have a lot of affection for credit unions and the staff who are committed to working in them and supporting them. They help deliver much needed financial services to many people in Scotland who may otherwise be rejected by banks and other lenders and who may be tempted to turn to easy cash lending sources with high interest repayments or even worse, to loan sharks with all the dangers that they bring. Of course, our credit unions are examples of financial cooperatives, member-owned on a not-for-profit basis. And it would be remiss of me not to remind the Chamber about the origins of the cooperative movement, the first recorded being in the wonderful village of Finnick in Ayrshire in 1761. The Finnick Weaver Society is considered to be the earliest known cooperative in the world 
where there are full details and records. Their foundation charter was dated March the 14th, 1761, and established a society to support each other, secure the future of their trade, and to ensure a fair price for their work. It was a challenging period for the weavers with many pressures on them to lower their prices. Inspectors were employed to check on their quality and their prices, and it could seriously damage the reputation of the village if they fell foul of these people. So the society presiding officer was formed in the sanctuary of the local church to ensure a certain degree of privacy and the freedom to organize. They agreed that they would be honest and faithful to one another, setting prices that were no higher or lower than the other towns and parishes in the area. Members paid two and six or 12 and a half pence to join. And the money was to be used for the good of the society and regular contributions were made to the local poor fund from those shared investments. People could also borrow from the funds at a fixed rate of interest, and the records demonstrate this clearly. So there we have it, presiding officer, the basic principles of a credit union established in Scotland in Finnick in 1761, only two years after Burns was born, just down the road in Alvey. The, we the weavers expanded to trade in food and books and a library was established in the village too, a proud history indeed, and one that the children in the village learn about and celebrate with pride. Fast forward to today, 258 years later, and we still see those same basic principles being observed on a daily basis in the credit union office that you might happen to visit. I pass by my own credit union in Kilmarnock on a near daily basis, which I've been a member of now for about eight years or so. And I can attest to the dedicated service given by the staff there to everyone who comes in for advice and support. You can just tell that there's something different going on in there. You, you have people who are genuinely committed to helping people out to try and find a way to say yes to applications rather than trotting out 100 reasons to say no, like many other lending institutions did in recent years. And it's really encouraging to read some of the stats that have been shared by members that shows Scotland has a healthy membership at about 400,000. Eh, much higher than England and Wales, I know has been said, but way behind Ireland with their three million or so members. So we need to aspire to those heights, I think, in Scotland too. More members are always welcome to join their credit unions and I would encourage all our MSPs to back their local credit unions and open an account. Wouldn't it be great, President Officer, if every member of this parliament was a member of a credit union. What a message that would send out. So here's, here's hoping. It was good to hear about the People Not Profit campaign mentioned by the Minister, which was launched last year by the Scottish Government to promote the benefits of joining a credit union, giving people information about how and where to join, and probably also helping to modernise the image that the credit unions have had in recent years. I know some would prefer them to be rebadged as community banks, and Alec Rowley mentioned that, and I quite like that term. But that's probably an issue for another day. The Junior Savers, Savers Scheme has also been mentioned by some of the members, which helps to introduce our younger, younger, uh, youngsters to the ideas of saving and budgeting. And it's seen another 47 new savings scheme to emerge in schools across the country. Thirdly, the million pound match funding by the Scottish Government that has accompanied the Carnegie Trust's million pounds affordable credit fund has done a lot, I think, to help people to access credit who otherwise wouldn't be able to obtain any financial assistance at all due to their circumstances. Uh, in the last few days, we received a briefing from Lloyds, and it was interesting too, because we can see that they, they also value their association with credit unions in Scotland, and the financial support they have given to many credit unions is substantial indeed. So, presiding officer, we have a lot to be proud of in exemplifying the great work done by our credit unions in Scotland. We have a wonderful history to share with the world, and the origins of this proud movement being so directly connected with Finnick and my constituency is a constant source of pride for the people of the village and hopefully for, hopefully for us too. May our credit unions continue to flourish and go from strength to strength. And could I once again ask all our MSPs who haven't yet opened a credit union account to do so as soon as they can. They will be welcomed with open arms and their savings will be put to great use for those in our communities who need our help most. Thank you.
The last of the open debate contributions is from Ruth Maguire. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm happy to join with members um, across the Chamber in celebrating the vital part that credit unions play in reducing inequality in Scotland by offering affordable loans and savings right at the heart of our communities. The role of credit unions in reducing poverty and the impact of financial worries is well recognised and has been described in reports by organisations such as the Joseph Rowntree Foundation and the Social Market Foundation. Owned and controlled by members and with membership based on a common bond, credit unions are underpinned by the cooperative ethos of people helping people and are committed to maximising the quality of service that's provided to members, not to the extent of profit that's provided to shareholders. As well as providing affordable loans with fairer conditions and longer repayment terms than payday lenders, credit unions also empower communities and encourage individual entrepreneurship. Indeed, they can often be termed community banks, a description that can well reflect their nature and their purpose. First Alliance Credit Union, based in Colwinning in my constituency, are certainly at the heart of our community. Since, um, the, since 2014, First Alliance have provided over 21,000 loans, totalling around £17 million. And all that money, or most of that money, is retained in our, in our local community. Um, they've given me some recent figures as well. Between October um, of last year and December of last year, they gave out 830 loans, 30% um, of which were given to people who would normally um, use high-cost lenders. And interestingly, 80% of those loans went to folk under the age of 55 years old. Now, um, when the Royal Bank of Scotland, the last bank in Colwinning, closed, First Alliance stepped up to reassure folk and to provide services to local people and businesses. And I think that credit unions, as well as being a, um, a, a good alternative to some of these other institutions, um, they do provide a good service. And it's not just for, as people say, folk on low incomes. They can also be great for people who want to make an ethical choice about where they, they put their own money. Now, I've spoken before in the chamber about the work that First Alliance undertook to deal with some of the challenges presented by welfare reform. They worked in partnership with North, um, North Ayrshire and South Ayrshire Council and six of our social landlords, um, which the credit union has a trusted partner status. Now that means that the services of the credit union can be used to help tenants who are in arrears or facing eviction. Currently, they're also involved in an important part partnership, um, Better Off North Ayrshire, a service for people who live in the area, which is funded by the European Social Fund and the Big Lottery. Better Off um, helps showing people the um, benefits they're entitled to, gives them assistance to apply online, also provides information on how to find and apply for jobs. Now, because the scheme aims to make sure that those needing help and advice are not passed around, um, the partnership element is crucial and the credit unions employed a caseworker who offers holistic advice to those they're in contact with, for example, with energy advice and housing advocacy. Now, the product that they offer um, as part of Better Off North Ayrshire is um, a loan for loan parents or the unemployed or those on um, a lower income who are looking to build a good credit history. Now, First Alliance recently gave a presentation to the Scottish Parliament's cross-party working group, as the Cabinet Secretary mentioned. And on that evening, we also heard from East Colbride Credit Union in, in your own constituency about their Home Start scheme, which aims to assist first-time buyers onto the property ladder. Now, that scheme works in partnership with an independent financial advisor and requires participants to save for a set period of time before helping them with a loan for a deposit. Now, those are just two examples. We've heard lots um, this afternoon of partnership working in an ethical manner to benefit people in our communities. We also heard um, about the People Not Profit campaign launched in November last year, raising awareness of the benefits of joining a credit union and doing that nationwide. As convener of the cross-party group on credit unions, I can testify to the collaborative approach that was taken to the development of this campaign, as well as all of the focus work and other things that went on outside. The views and feedback from members of the cross-party group were reflected in the campaign um, over a couple of sessions here in the Parliament. Um, I would ask um, the Cabinet Secretary um, in considering the work going forward to uh, further that campaign. One of the 
ideas that was, was mooted was that some of the materials would be available for credit unions themselves to use and perhaps have mini campaigns locally. I wonder if you'd be able to comment on that, that would be helpful. Um, Presiding officer, in, in closing, I suppose I would just say that Scot Scotland's credit union movement has been providing vital financial services to our communities for over 45 years. And I know that with continued support from across political divides, they'll continue to do so for many more years. And I guess finally, um, I would encourage members who've spoken so passionately about their local credit unions and the wider credit union movement today to join us at the cross-party group and con consider taking some of that supportive work forward. And to any local credit unions watching, do give your local MSPs a nudge to join us. Thank you. We now move to the closing speeches and I call Neil Finlay. Uh, eight minutes, please. Uh, thanks, President Officer. Um, I, I want to begin, like others, by declaring an interest. I'm a member of Blackburn and Seafield Credit Union and advise that my mum is also a, a volunteer with the organisation. And can I also apologise to the Minister for missing part of her uh, uh, opening speech. Um, I think a lot of us see credit unions as one of the great untapped resources in the country. Uh, I, I think many of us and people have expressed that today could see them playing a much more significant role in, the, in our communities and in uh, our constituencies if they had the uh, right support. Um, they are tremendous organisations providing that ethical and responsible and sustainable alternative to the uh, big banks who, as we've seen time and time again over the last decade or so, consistently rip off their customers, have been repeatedly fined by regulators, have closed branches across the length and breadth of the country and have made many, many staff uh, redundant. I think that financial model, that model of banking has been discredited and I think it's time we looked at other alternative models and took them very seriously. And I think that's the plea that many people have made today. I, I think the comment that they are not Kuthi organisations, I think is absolutely spot on. They are very credible uh, uh, community assets. Um, I believe there's a moral duty upon public policy makers to help develop that credible alternative model of uh, personal financial management uh, because that promotes not just financial well-being and inclusion but it prevents people from being exploited by uh, some of the worst aspects of the financial sector. Those payday lenders, thankfully some of them who have gone out of business but some of them are still here raking in profits. And it also takes people away from some of the high street banks um, who again charge very high rates for their loans. Like Angela Constance, I've worked closely with the uh, local credit unions in West Lothian to identify some of the uh, key issues they face today. And some people have raised some of them, but there's more that I would like to raise. And they're very specific issues that they have asked me to raise. And I, issues that would help them grow their business, that would help them thrive and ultimately help more of their uh, constituents and I would appreciate if the Minister could address some of these points in winding up or indeed write to me with the details if she doesn't have the information. I'm advised that um, many credit unions have difficulty acquiring their own sort code um, and this appears to be a luxury reserved for the big banks. Uh, this would allow them to bank salaries or act as a, a current account uh, uh, and at present members um, don't have a choice but to have a current account from a bank or building society. So I think it, uh, that issue needs to be addressed and I think they believe that their membership could expand uh, and savers have a, uh, uh, get a greater choice out with the big banks if that could happen. Um, a number of members have mentioned uh, the, the issue of credit union access in the parliament itself and I think that's a very good thing. Uh, my understanding is currently employees can save via, via credit union through payroll but staff can only go through one credit union designated by parliament uh, and I think they should be able to choose to save with other credit unions particularly the ones in their own constituency and in their own region so I hope that uh, the powers that be are listening uh, to that. Um, we should also, I think, lead by example when both the government and the parliament could 
include a clause in procurement contracts to ensure that every contractor appointed by the Parliament or the Government uh, must ensure that employees have a payroll option to save through a credit union. So I hope the Minister, uh, if I can distract her for a second, will uh, investigate whether there is an option through public procurement if we are giving out contracts that companies who get those contracts could include a payroll saving option via a credit union in those contracts. I think that would be a very simple, a very low-cost initiative that could expand uh, membership quite considerably. Uh, Annabel Ewing, Liam MacArthur and others, uh, Joanne Lamont and others mentioned the credit unions in schools uh, project. And again, the West Lothian credit unions have raised this with me. Uh, West Lothian credit union has fully embraced that project and it's grown its membership in a number of schools. But the reality is that this type of work costs the credit union money to deliver. Um, they don't make any money via loans uh, through this work. So it's actually a cost imposed upon them. So what they need is long-term sustainable funding for that project from the government. It's, it is no good the Scottish government providing funding for schools, the schools programme for just one year or two. Then I'm not knowing whether that funding is going to continue thereafter because if we see the long-term benefits then the project and the funding has to be long-term and it has to exist through the entire um, life cycle of the school pupils uh, time at school because what we're hearing is that it's embraced quite um, successfully at primary school but when the transition to high school uh, occurs then often the system doesn't follow or the fu uh, funding doesn't follow it's not to say that happens in all schools, of course it doesn't, but um, that was one of the issues raised. And I think we all agree that credit union and financial education should be embedded in our, uh, in our schools. So I would appeal to the Minister to look at how we put a much um, greater horizon on that funding so that it continues through the entire um, school life of any pupil. Uh, Jan Lamont alluded to the issue around bankruptcy and insolvency. And uh, it appears that credit unions suffer drastically when a member who ha has a loan enters uh, bankruptcy. It seems that insolvency practitioners are often claiming a disproportionate amount of the debt owed. In some cases, uh, I've heard of where uh, someone has, say, debts of six or 7,000 the insolvency practitioner is claiming around 5,800, as much as that, leaving little for other creditors, including the credit union. And that is just fundamentally wrong. And I hope the government will look at that as a matter of urgency because it is uh, a big issue. W one other issue, and, and it will be out with the uh, remit of the Scottish government, I think, but I think there could be advice provided on this, is the way in which credit unions deal with their reserves, because currently, they are getting a very low return on their uh, investment of those reserves. Um, current interest rates means that they're getting a piffling return for the money that they are sitting on. And if there was some ability for them to use that, I've heard credit unions suggest that they would like to invest some of that money in social housing or renewable energy or in various other projects. Um, but um, at the moment, they're receiving very, very uh, small sums back. And that is where they try and make their profit in order to invest back in the business. So I think there's something we need to look at there. I think many people have mentioned the um, People Not Profit campaign. And I think we all support that. But again, I think these campaigns have to be consistent, repetitive, and they need to be across various mediums in order to ensure that we build momentum and uh, membership. Um, President Officer, as the gap between the, the many and the few is widening, uh, credit unions are essential to provide that alternative to the exploitative financial institutions that we've seen go before them. Uh, I think we have to ensure that credit unions are expanding and expanding as much as possible. There's a lot of support in this parliament for credit unions across the political spectrum, um, but they have to be supported and their work promoted. Um, and I appeal to the government to look at a much longer term view, take a much longer term view of this in terms of the funding that can be provided. Alexander Stewart, around nine minutes, please.
Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I am delighted to be taking part in the debate on celebrating the role of credit unions in Scotland's communities and closing for the Scottish Conservatives this afternoon. The concept of credit union is quite simple. We've heard that today. Uh, members save uh, a pool and that pool is then used uh, to ensure that other members can borrow. And across my own region of Mid-Scotland and Fife, I have seen it firsthand, uh, the success that has taken place uh, in a number of locations uh, in Fife, in Perth, in Canross, and Clackmannanshire. And Alex Rowley, in the opening uh, of his uh, uh, contribution this afternoon, talked about the successes that he has seen uh, in uh, the Winalty and Log uh, And then Annabel Ewing commented on that being its 30th anniversary. I'd like to add my uh, weight to that as well. Uh, the, 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 the celebrations that they will in in, no doubt endure uh, over the next uh, year or so uh, are well and truly uh, uh, given the opportunity for so many people uh, across that community. But the impact of having across a safe and reliable financial service can have uh, on individuals is quite significant. That makes the difference and we've heard today that there are over 90 credit unions in Scotland. And the impact and the important work uh, that the facilities and credit unions do throughout Scotland is to be commended, uh, congratulated and encouraged. And under the Conservative, uh, the UK government has a strong record when it comes to making financial services more accessible, particularly by encouraging the growth of the social lending sector. The UK government has also taken action to clamp down on some of the exploitative behaviours seen uh, uh, by uh, payday lenders uh, and, and to ensure that that sector uh, is given some uh, regulation. Uh, and that has been introduced by the, the cap uh, that's been uh, put in place by the Financial Conduct Authority. And moreover, at the start of this financial year, five and a half million pounds was announced for investigations into the prosecutions of illegal lending while supporting the victims of these crimes. Now, we've heard today about the, the difficulties individuals find themselves in, and any of us can find ourselves in situations uh, uh, depending on our circumstances. But if they are then become victims of, of a situation uh, that is not of their own making, uh, when they're trying to ensure that they have financial resources, that needs to be looked at. So, Deputy Presiding Officer, the government has also made significant financial investment uh, into ensure that credit union membership across areas where there is a high risk uh, of individuals being targeted by loan sharks uh, and help vulnerable people to borrow to ensure that that is safe and responsible. And I think that in itself is a key sector uh, and a key success within this sector. The government is also providing interest-free loans and prize-linked uh, saving schemes to encourage more people to make use of credit unions. And that's moving in the right direction. And, many, and my colleague Michelle Ballantyne has talked about today and she mentioned in her address that the government has increased the common bond limit to allow larger credit unions to expand. And I believe that's a step also in the right direction. There are, however, some limits to the types of financial services that credit unions can provide. And currently they are prohibited from offering credit cards and insurance schemes. The Association of British Credit Unions has called for reform of the UK legislation that would allow credit unions to keep pace with the changing nature of financial services. The suggestions are currently ones that should be given real consideration uh, by the UK government. It is clear that here in Scotland, with 7% of the population are members of credit unions, we already have and play an important part in our society. Uh, and we've seen the increasing membership uh, of 20,000 people joining the credit union over the last year, while membership in Scotland is four times higher than in England and three times higher than in Wales. But we still have a long way to go when we compete with Northern Ireland, which accounts for an outstanding one third of UK entire credit unions total. As others have indicated, and it has been pointed out, the Association of British Credit Unions, moreover, needs to be done to ensure that the vulnerability uh, and the resources are there. And Deputy Presiding Officer, the efforts that have been made by the Scottish Government to raise awareness of credit unions through the People Not Profit campaign are to be welcomed. And I knew that, that the Cabinet Secretary made that point and others have done that as well. But I commend and congratulate them for doing that. All the funding that has been put in place also to develop the junior saving schemes and I welcome the new resources that have been put forward to try and engage and encourage that to grow and expand because once again that's another step in the right direction ensuring that young people understand the financial situation as they grow uh, into their adulthood and they go into the world uh, of jobs and markets uh, and all of this they need to know uh, what they can and can expect and, and they should not be fallen into traps because many organizations and companies are seeing 
seeing them as potential future uh, for themselves. So it's important that they understand that and the better engagement of young people and that schools are being actively involved. And we've heard today about that opportunity to go into schools and to work with young people. So I would very much commend uh, that and going forward. The good quality financial education at an early age is a real good experience and talks about how money should be managed. It can make a real difference for young people's lives to ensure that they're able to make better informed financial decisions on their future. This afternoon's debate, Deputy Prime has indeed been a very interesting one and we've heard some very well articulated contributions from across the chamber. And I would talk about what Jeremy Balfour uh, initiated in his when he talked about uh, the, the setting up of high standards and also the vulnerability of disabled and older people who have been very vulnerable to scams and want to ensure that their money is in a safe place. Uh, and the banks were safe for them, uh, but that doesn't necessarily seem to be the part in present. And then Andy Whiteman talked about uh, the financial institutions and the failings that we've experienced in these financial institutions. We all have to acknowledge that, uh, that they, they were seen at one time as the, as the place where we should be, uh, be able to look upon and, uh, and manage, but that has not been the case. They have let down many people and they have let down many communities. And Liam MacArthur spoke with real passion about the technology side of things. And I think that's important. We need to acknowledge that technology can assist us and can support us going forward. And then Maurice Corey talked about uh, the veterans and ex-servicemen and women. And sometimes they find it very difficult to go back into civilian life uh, and find themselves uh, being trapped uh, into situations and circumstances. So I think all of these sectors have a role to play and we have our, our part to play to ensure that they are protected uh, and going forward. This afternoon we've also heard about the, the cross-party group and uh, I can commend and congratulate Ruth Maguire as the, the convener of that group. Uh, you know, there is a real passion in this parliament for that to take place and that group has done an immense amount of work already and I'm sure that will continue. Surely. Ruth Maguire. I just I thank Alexander Stewart for taking the intervention. I wonder if you'd like to join us at our next meeting. <laughs> Knew Alex that was coming. Andrew so Stewart. I will say I'll be delighted to, if you can indicate when the meeting takes place, I will be more than happy uh, to turn up to that meeting. So as I say, we, we, we've talked a lot today uh, about that all, all individuals ensure that their work is being uh, secure. And there's been campaigns and advertising campaigns to try and promote and ensure that that happens, Deputy Presiding Officer. So in conclusion, uh, credit unions play a vital and important role in our society by helping people to borrow and save money. Uh, and we will be supporting uh, the Labour Amendment uh, this afternoon. The efforts of both the UK and the Scottish governments to increase the awareness of credit unions and to help grow are of immense importance and we welcome the fact that we will work together uh, and as I've said before this parliament coming together and working together can make a real difference and that's what we need to do Deputy Presiding Officer to ensure that people are confident in supporting these credit unions who have done so much over so long to support so many. Thank you. Now ask um, the Cabinet Secretary to wind up please. Aileen Campbell, um, we've got a little bit of extra time. So around 12 minutes should take us up to just before decision time. All right, no worries. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And it has been a, a really consensual but highly informed debate that I've thoroughly enjoyed listening to and getting the opportunity to participate in as well. And the examples of good work that members have described highlight the impact and difference that credit unions are making to communities right across Scotland and have been doing so for, for many, many decades. But I do have to say that I did appreciate it being catapulted back to my primary school years when I took my 20 pence to my local primary school for my super squirrel account. So uh, I was very proud of my super squirrel rucksack. So I appreciate Kezia Dugdale uh, raising and bringing back that uh, memory. But while mem members have described uh, good work happening in all airts and parts of Scotland, what is common across all of those stories is that Scotland's credit unions are driven by a passion to improve the lives of their members and make a positive impact on the communities that they serve. The clear cross-party support for credit unions in this chamber this afternoon stands as a testimony to this hard work and dedication, and it should be viewed as a positive platform from which to help grow and build the credit union movement. And that's why the Scottish Government seeks to continue to support the credit union sector. And this support will continue to be designed in partnership with the sector, building on our national awareness raising campaign before Christmas, 
and our programme of supporting credit union partnership with schools across the country. But many members described the innovative and nimbleness of what credit unions offer in response to local needs in terms of geography, but also in terms of communities of interest. And I appreciated Maurice Corey, I don't know if he's there, mentioned the establishment of the Armed Services Personnel Credit Union to help support the needs of veterans and ex-military personnel. And likewise, I appreciated hearing about the ben Benarte and Loch Gelly Credit Union from Annabel Ewan and I Alex Rowley and the innovative work that that uh, credit union is doing in schools, its considerable assets that have been described, its share value, its human and compassionate approach to credit management. And I would be certainly delighted to do what I can in response to Annabel Ewing's invitation to mark its 30th uh, anniversary. Similarly, we heard about the good work that's happening right across West Lothian with its considerable lending capabilities as well. And of course, credit unions right across uh, Glasgow and, and Alexander Stewart uh, also raised the ones in his uh, region. Many members spoke though about the work of credit unions as a way to support those who may be more financially vulnerable or excluded. And as, a, and a, and as an appreciated safety net, as the safety net of social security gets gripped, in tight, even tighter through austerity measures of the UK government. We have also heard about how credit unions save those for whom mainstream or high street lending is not a viable option due to issues with credit ratings or not having a bank account eh, and especially saving them from those predatory or exploitative eh, lenders. And Kezia Dugdale articulated some of the worst practices that have gone on in her remarks. But that lack of financial resilience for many, uh, the, the many talked about by Bill Kidd and Andy Whiteman illustrates why credit unions are still so important, especially with the uncertainty of Brexit on the horizon and the financial impact that that may bring, particularly to those who are most at risk and those with least financial resilience. Uh, Kizzy Dugdale also mentioned that credit unions should not be viewed simply as cuthy, nice things to have. And similarly, Joanne Lament, the uh, credit union movement is seen as something that is comfortable, I think again echoed by uh, Neil Finlay. And I absolutely agree with that point. These are serious financial players lending millions with considerable assets uh, and delivering products that include housing support, energy advice, money management and house purchasing. And they do all of that with people and their members at their heart. That people not profit motivation and that desire to do social good is what sets credit unions apart because their ethos is in direct contrast to the banking practices at the time of the crash. The banking entities that Andy Whiteman uh, reminded us that, that were supposed to be too big to fail, they did fail and they harmed the global economy and they harmed those with the least uh, the most. And it was a wake-up call and it showed a clear need to rebalance the economy and a need, as Alec Rowley and Bill Kidd suggested, to find a much more sustainable and e ethical financial service. And the relevance of credit unions is needed now more than ever as, and today's debate, hope, I hope, goes some way to ensure that everyone understands that a credit union is and can be for them. It's not something that should be viewed as for uh, other communities or someone else. It is something that should be viewed as something that's viable and a good, uh, viable and feasible option for them. Absolutely. Emma Harper. Thank you, presiding officer, and I thank the cabinet secretary for taking an intervention while listening to this debate this afternoon and following Willie Coffey's contribution. I've just texted and had a response from my friend in Stranraer, who runs the Stranraer Credit Union, asked how I could contribute and join and open an account. And I would like to ask the cabinet secretary, would she agree that this debate has been worthwhile in parliament to raise awareness of the benefits and successes of credit unions? And maybe it's a wee push for folk like myself to join a credit union. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely, I agree with uh, Emma Harper. Uh, and if that's all that comes from this debate is that we have credit, uh, an additional member in a credit union, that is a good thing. But of course, I think the lesson for us all is that that shouldn't just be uh, Emma that takes that move, that we all should consider what more we can do locally within our constituencies and our own family members, uh, to, to, uh, for own family members to take part uh, and become a member of a credit union. So I absolutely uh, commend uh, Emma Harper for taking such swift action during uh, this debate. And I think also shows, um, uh, again, the, the, the way in which uh, local credit unions can be nimble and adapt to 
uh, immediate need uh, and, immediate re and immediately respond to uh, requests for members. So David Torrance also though set out the relevance of credit unions within the context of banking closures. Again, I think linking back to that whole uh, discussion that members raised around the banking practices at the time of the crash. And uh, banks though have asserted uh, that as greater numbers of transactions are carried out online, footfall in branches has continued to increase. However, few customers have gone fully digital and physical banking services are still seen as a core part of banking requirements. Even as online offerings become much more sophisticated, there is a and remains a need for physical access to banking services, particularly where customers seek advice or support in addition to transactions. Uh, but we must also note that banks' increased focus on those digital challenges will have a disproportionate impact on vulnerable groups. Those are older customers, customers on lower incomes, and customers in areas with poorer access to digital services such as broadband or 4G. I think a point that was made uh, uh, by Jeremy uh, Balfour. So that's now why we need to work hard to uh, in ensure that there are uh, financial alternatives. And I think it's right to recognise the need to examine ways to help credit unions to not only provide that face-to-face -face support, but also to keep pace with the technological advances uh, that banks are making if it is to continue to attract a broader base of members. And I think those were particularly important points that were raised through today's debate. I'd also like to, though, briefly uh, and quickly highlight this, that Scotland's credit unions are, though, much pa are part of a wider social enterprise and cooperative movement because of the significant mentions made by members uh, of uh, the cooperative uh, movement and uh, social enterprise. Uh, and that significant contribution on this was um, Willie Coffey, who gave us a historic overview uh, and the origins of the cooperative movement uh, of Fenwick. Now, I have to say, though, as the MSP for New Lanark, there might be a bit of a fight about where the origins of the cooperative movement began. Nonetheless, I take on board uh, the, the Willie Coffey's uh, shows, his contribution shows, though, that while we have talked around some credit unions being 20, 30 years old, that actually the, the origins of that go far, far uh, further back in time. And it's important to link it back to social enterprise because for more than a decade, the Scottish Government has worked with the social enterprise sector to establish a holistic ecosystem for support, including national startup incubators, free business advice and leadership programmes within the social enterprise world. And we'll continue to support this as we deliver our 10-year social enterprise strategy that was published in 2016, building, uh, at, though, on the, and ever mindful of the legacy of the Fennec uh, weavers. But I think also we should be mindful of the, the growth of social enterprise because because of that plan and I think that's been a clear message today from members about the need if we want to grow credit union about being strategic in our approach. So what next for credit unions? Well while the debate was, debate was consensual it didn't mean that it was simply a self-congratulatory discussion without challenge because while we are right to acknowledge the progress that has been made by credit unions we need to not be complacent and we need to grow and let this sector flourish. So I'm, I was pleased to announce the, that more more money to extend the junior savings programme with £85,000, bringing our total funding for this to over £350,000. And this will enable more children to engage with local uh, credit unions and learn the importance of saving. Uh, but whilst we did laugh and joke about the super squirrel, I think the serious point is that we do need to reflect that, that in that enduring memory of that scheme, and as we work out how we move this junior scheme forward, that we know we shouldn't be scared to look to the past about where good practice did uh, exist as we uh, look to work out how we make that uh, issue flourish further. Johan Lamont. Thank the Cabinet Secretary very much for taking the intervention. It's just in case we miss it before the end um, of, your, of your contribution, I wonder if you would confirm your willingness to meet with perhaps a cross-party group and with credit unions on this very specific issue around the unintended consequences of some of the debt management schemes? Yeah. Uh, it's difficult to hear. Could I ask members to have a wee bit of wish, please? Uh, Aileen Campbell. I'm, I'm glad that Joanne in, intervened at that point because I was about to mention her contribution and Liam MacArthur, who also in their contributions drew out the explicit link between saving and curriculum for excellence, that need for much more um, uh, financial awareness uh, for children uh, at school. So I'm happy to meet and to discuss some of those uh, wider issues that she discussed in her contribution. Members also asked me about what more can be done to heighten the visibility of credit unions in the high street and I'm really happy to do just that whether that's within my own parameters of my own portfolio which includes business improvement districts community empowerment measurements regeneration but also in discussion across portfolios with Derek Mackay and Michael Matheson eh, as well it was also 
Yes, yes, yes. Neil Finlay. Uh, I understand time's running short, but a number of um, members raised very specific points with the Minister. If she would be so kind as to write to the members who raised those uh, in response. Yep, absolutely. Uh, IT was, uh, abs I will do that, I'll endeavour to get to the point so that uh, Neil made in his remarks. IT was also raised, both as a reminder, to not lose sight of the importance of face-to-face -face advice and financial help, but also in terms of credit unions needing to keep pace and be as convenient as they can be in order to grow. Angela Constance, though, also made a very uh, authoritative contribution, and that is because much of the work she did as community secretary was to, po so to support c uh, credit union growth. And she did mention the need to do more on payroll deduction, and absolutely agree with her. Uh, uh, her steer to attach uh, to that more rigorous and stretching targets in order to drive the growth that is needed to enable workers to access that benefit. The Scottish Government's business uh, pledge included encouragement to establish a payroll deduction scheme, and that pledge is currently being reviewed, and I'll use that as a hook to push for more action here and assure her that we will continue to be ambitious and will work with the Welsh Government on their work to use financial transactions in their credit union growth. Ruth Maguire also acknowledged the success of the recent campaign, People Not Profit, and a plea to enable more localised campaigns to grow. Uh, I think that sounds uh, reasonable. However, if I do understand that there were a toolkit of resources that were sent out to credit unions. If n anyone didn't get that, then we can send it on to them. But I'm happy to meet with her at our credit union uh, cross-party group to explore what more we can perhaps do in response to her questions. Neil Finlay, though, did mention cert codes. I'll take on board that issue and, and we'll look, endeavour to get back to him. He did also mention a, 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 a raise an issue around reserves, and again, I'll get back to him on that one. On procurement, I think it's really interesting. I met with his call, one of his colleagues, Councillor Matt Brown from Preston uh, the, uh, Council, about the community wealth building. And again, we talked through some of the innovative things that we could possibly explore around procurement. So again, I think that's very much in keeping with the tone of the debate today, and happy again to uh, meet with him to discuss these further. Uh, presiding officer, people have raised lots of interesting thoughts, ideas, solutions uh, to the challenges that credit unions uh, are facing, but all with an attempt to ensure that we can grow this sector, and I think that's important. I think everyone has united around the rallying cry of putting people before profit and putting people at the heart of services and advice. Uh, and that's why um, I think what we can do today and use this debate as a, as a platform is to think about how we wrap some of these ideas together to have a much more strategic and coordinated approach about how we endeavour to grow credit unions, using the ideas, the knowledge, the expertise that has been found across this chamber to do just that. Our people stand to great... Uh, to to benefit greatly if we get this right, because if we want to have an economy that doesn't just measure GDP, but measures well-being and kindness and ethical practices, then this is exactly the policy area that we need to do more on to uh, achieve that um, aim of creating a fairer, more inclusive uh, society and ensuring that people benefit from uh, good ethical financial practices. So I again just underline my appreciation to everyone who took part in this debate. It has been really uh, informative and I appreciate everyone's remarks. Thank you very much. And that concludes our debate on celebrating the role of credit unions. The next item is consideration of motion 15423 in the name of Aileen Campbell on an appointment of the chair of the Poverty and Inequality Commission. And could I call on Aileen Campbell to move the motion? Formally moved. Thank you very much. We turn now to decision time. And there are three questions today. The first is that amendment 15426.1 in the name of Alex Rowley which seeks to amend motion 15426 in the name of Aileen Campbell on celebrating the role of credit unions in Scotland's communities be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that motion 15426 in the name of Aileen Campbell as amended be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And our final question is that motion 15423 in the name of Aileen Campbell on the appointment of the chair of the Poverty and Inequality Commission be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed, and given that that vote was unanimous, on behalf of all members here in Parliament, may I congratulate Bill Scott on his appointment as the Commissioner. <laughs> and that concludes decision time. I close this meeting.